Well, pull up a chair and set a spell here at Tales from SYL Ranch Alive, the vlog cast that reminds you to always know where your towel is. And I'm your host, Bill Stone. Well, hey, Captain Jesse, how are you doing tonight? Today on Tales from SYL Ranch, we're going to have the Fandai Masters retro review of The Curse of Frankenstein. And a bit of news, I'll be talking about the Brett Kavanaugh fiasco going on. Uh, talk a little bit about MGTOW, men going their own way, and how that actually relates to that whole mess. And we'll also talk about something a little nicer, which is Ivan Ortega's fan edit of Star Wars The Last Jedi, which is a really fun time to talk. Yep, a ranch talk, I guess. Actually, you know, weekend after next, that'll be some serious ranch talk. I'll actually be out there doing it, so... To explain my show for new viewers, those of you who may not pop in immediately on the hour, so I won't start in on the review and have you going, why did you start without me? I do live reviews here on this show. Sometimes I do serious films and TV. Sometimes I do schlock for the kicks of it, although the last couple of months have been very schlock-free. I do sometimes review movies with modern appeals, like uh, Star Wars movies, Marvel's movies, Doctor Who, Star Trek, Discovery, The Orville. But usually I tend to stick to a period that's from about 1982, sorry, 1900 to 1980, and that's because the period after 1980 is pretty well documented, what with Star Wars and all the science fiction we got after it, plus all the amazing technology we got. But the period 1900 to 1980 is still filled with a lot of science fiction and a lot of science fiction fandom that's unfortunately being lost to history, and so that's part of why I do the show. I will take any and all questions, comments, and nasty remarks, and I will respond to as many of my viewers as possible. You can tell me if I missed something, if I'm completely full of crap, or if I just happen to be amazingly awesome, which is far more likely. I go into more uh, depth than most reviewers. I don't just talk about whether I liked a movie or not, or what individual bits about it I may have liked. I also talk about the acting, the directing, the cinematography, mechanics of making a film. And I can talk about this with some level of authority, not a ton, but with some authority, because a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, I was once an actor. So I can speak with some authority, not as much as a real working actor can today, but with some authority. As they often say, those who can do and those who can't teach. And I suppose probably reviewing falls under that latter category. Uh, let's see, why did, uh, Captain Jesse's asking, why did Bob uh, Igar uh, pull a Frankenstein movie, uh, got fired from CBS and moved to Disney and take uh, the full blame for Frankenstein Wars the last year, uh, for the last year, oh gosh, uh, let me get into that when we get into actually talking about that fan edit I talked about, because that thing's really interesting. And what do I think about gaming, know about gaming consoles? Nothing, nothing whatsoever. My actual gaming console, if you can call it that, I, I have a, um, oh, it's a Nintendo, uh, what, what is it, the Nintendo Cubes things, those from about nigh on to 20 years ago, 20 yaren ago, I guess. So I know absolutely nothing about it. I'll mention a little bit about the show's format, uh, because going forward, at some point, I'm going to make some hard uh, changes on it. Uh, it is now becoming problematic for me using YouTube as my primary platform because they have repeatedly blocked my videos worldwide or assigned copyrights entirely speciously or for frivolous reasons, and their algorithm actively um, undermines live streams. But I have a plan. I will continue streaming here always, always on Monday nights on YouTube because I need YouTube's eyes to, and they're one of the few places that does live streaming to speak of that works well. But as soon as the video is done processing, I will then put it up on my reel.video site and I will then create and update pages on my Tales from SYL Ranch website, which you can see at sylranch.sdf.org and it's there now. It isn't quite where I want it to be yet, but it's getting there. And then I will delete the stream from YouTube before they have a chance to block it or reassign copyrights or otherwise undermine it with disclaimers that screw up and undermine my content. In the video's place, I will have a trailer, a pre-recorded trailer that explains why the video isn't there and points the viewers to my website and also to the Reel.video channel. I will upload clips from time to time. I did that several times this last week. Oh, you have no idea what a nightmare that is. Just to get a 10 minute or so clip out of my show is, oh, it's so painful because of my old equipment. But I'll do it, by God, I'll do it. My hope is to maybe whet the viewer's appetite with a small 10 minute or so clip and then reel them in for the full three hours. So tonight, the review of uh, um, uh, uh, 
Frankenstein, uh, The Curse of Frankenstein, which is a really nice little movie. As always, when we get into movies that are kind of old like this, i got to put things into some bit of perspective. Half a second while I move a few things around on my computer here. I redid a few things you can see behind me. I, for the first time, am not having a green screen since I moved. This is, in fact, the uh, actual um, 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 living room of where I'm living right now. So, <laughs> uh, the time on this movie. This was 1957, and to give you an idea about uh, some of the ways things were different back then. Back in 1957, a house would cost you about $12,200. Now, if you change that and you convert it into modern dollars, taking into account inflation, you discover that's about $109,000, $109,500. Your average rent would be about $90, but again, adjusted for inflation, that's about $807. Your average yearly wages, would, with the median wage, was about $45,50 a uh, year and if you translate that into modern dials it, it's close to 41,000 which is the median salary today. Um, a gas of gallon of gas was about 24 cents per gallon however converted into modern dollars that's about two dollars and 15 cents today and a new car would set you back uh, well uh, not this car but um, oh, uh, an average new car would set you back about two thousand seven hundred dollars which today translates into 20 ish dollars. Oh yes, no widescreen TVs in 1957. Absolutely not. I don't know how the big the uh, biggest widescreen biggest TV was back then, but not very damn big. 12 inches, something like that, were big in 1957. By the way, I get all this information from a site called What Happened in, and uh, in this case, it's 1957. I've got a link for it below if you ever want to take a look at it. It's uh, the people of history, uh, people, the people history dot com, and you can look out for any year that you want to. Things that happened. Yep, it just says the TVs were black and white and 4.3 aspect ratio. Yep, definitely no widescreen and definitely not very big either. Uh, things that happened in 1957, they saw continued growth of more uh, taller t fins on the back of new cars, as you can kind of see from this one here, as well as more lights on the cars with bigger and more powerful engines. That year, the Soviet Union la launched the first Earth's first um, uh, um, uh, artificial satellite, Sputnik 1. Movies that were big that year included 12 Angry Men and The Bridge Over the River Kwai, which is movies we remember today. TV shows back then that started that year were Perry Mason and Maverick for the first time shown that year. Music was rock and roll. Little Richard was up and coming in the charts. And uh, popular toys included the Slinky and the Hula Hoops. We saw continued growth of credit. In fact, two-thirds of all new cars were bought on credit at that point, which was relatively new for that time period. Um, believe it or not, until the middle part of the last century, people didn't buy everything in sight on credit. In fact, they still didn't buy everything in credit in that time. Some areas that would cause problems. Uh, that year, South Vietnam was invaded by uh, Viet Cong guerrillas, so uh, we would this would start to escalate into what we come to think of as the Vietnam Warriors later. And troops that year were sent to Arkansas to enforce anti-segregation laws. So, clothing. I always like to talk about clothing because it was often radically different. Uh, what you're seeing here is roughly what you'd wear if you're a woman in 1957. The difference in between what you're seeing here is what you're not seeing here. Uh, there was a lot of underwear involved here. There was a bullet bra, granny panties, a uh, full slip over that, and then if you were having like they do in some of these with those slightly poofed out dresses rather than the uh, you know pencil dresses, uh, those skirts might have a whole bunch of extra stuff underneath it to make sure that it stayed poofed out. Uh, you'd also have a um, garter belt and stockings because pantyhose yeah, hadn't yet been ex in, uh, invented. And uh, almost certainly women would be wearing high heels of some kind. Men, on the other hand, had it quite a lot easier. Couldn't find it in the color picture, unfortunately. But this is what you might have seen on a male adult at that time period. They were guys wearing suits and hats. In fact, the hat was a big deal. Most of the time, a child or a teenager did not get a hat. A hat was something only adult males wore, so that was kind of a big deal at the time. A petticoat, yes, they would have petticoats and all kinds of weird stuff under there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, uh, I, I, women had it a lot harder than men. Uh, men had just mostly what we think about as underwear today: boxers, uh, t-shirt, 
that's about it. You know, socks, you know, pretty straightforward. Uh, now there was some, uh, there was a certain level of uh, um, uh, of uh, options if you were a teenager. Uh, if you were a teenage girl, the likelihood was that you were going to wear something very similar to that last picture you saw. If you were a teenage boy, on the other hand, you probably wouldn't have the hat, and you might not have a tie or a suit coat. If you were a greaser, somebody who rode a motorcycle, you might have a t-shirt, a leather jacket, but generally speaking, you'd have some kind of button-down um, shirt or something like that that you'd be wearing. Talk a little bit about dates in 1957 because, uh, well, I usually do when I get into these older 50s movies because it sort of becomes important. What you're seeing here, by the way, is a picture looking down the street uh, at uh, in down to beautiful downtown Lincoln, Nebraska, circa about 1957. It's a little hard to see, but there's a vertical theater marquee on the one side that says Stewart on it. Uh, that theater still exists today. It is now the Rococo Theater, but it is and uh, was at that time the Grand Dame of theaters. It had uh, four balconies. It seated well over a thousand people, had a big chandelier and uh, box seats and all kinds of stuff. Um, very much a very large theater of the time. If you were going on a date, in a theater, you would have this complicated set of rules that you would be engage in, social restrictions that everyone was expected to follow, and if you didn't follow them, uh, well, it meant there was something wrong with you on one side or the other. A man would pick up a date, oftentimes in one of those cars, probably not like the one I showed you, but a little bit more like some of these here on the street. Uh, pick up a date in a car, and when he picked you up, he would uh, take his date out to the car, open the door for her, hold her hand while she got in, and then wait until she adjusted her clothing and close the door, go around to the other side and get in. And upon reaching the theater or somewhere near to it, they would park, do the exact same thing in reverse. And uh, if they were walking down the street and the man was walking with the woman, he would always walk on the side of the street that was closest to the street. This was a symbolic show of protection because it meant that if something splashed up from out of the, out of the street, it would hit the man and not the woman in all her expensive, uh, complicated clothing. Uh, uh, Leave it to Beaver started in, 19, in October of 1657. I did not know that. Did not know that. Does not surprise me. Does not surprise me at all. Um, but that was a symbolic show of protection, and it was one that you always observed when walking down the street with a woman. When, if you were walking otherwise, not down the street, the woman would always be on the man's left, and that was because the right arm, by tradition, was the fighting arm. It was the one in ancient days you would pull a sword with and fight with, and so that was uh, the left side was considered the place of honor for a woman. By the way, that also uh, held true with men. Older men would be placed on that side. Um, in decreasing order of age, or increasing order of age, rather. Youngest person, older person, oldest person, etc. as you moved on out. Hey, Marshall, Noah, <laughs> it's nice to have you here regardless. I'm just setting the stage, putting the context in behind it. When you got to the theater, man would always open the door. That was a requirement. Women never opened the door when they were with a date. A man always opened the door. And if you went into the theater, then the man would make his way down a row first in order to, again, symbolic show of protection, clear the aisle for the woman, make sure there was nothing that would harm her in between the uh, seat and her. And only after she had sat down would he then sit down and remove his hat. The hat removal was, again, a symbolic show of protection. It was saying, it was go like going back to medieval times when uh, knights wore helmets. You would remove your helmet only when you were sure you weren't going to have to fight about something. And so you were saying, okay, everything's safe now. I could take off my hat. Now, uh, physical contact was pretty limited on a date. It was not cool uh, to do a lot of the things that we would do on dates just as a uh, you know, matter of course today. You could not uh, very easily, uh, you know, have much physical contact with your date. The difference between being if you were going to see a scary movie. If you're going to see a scary movie, there was a little social dance that men and women could be involved in where the woman would pretend to be scared by whatever the hell was going on on the screen, and the man could pretend to console her, thus allowing them to snuggle a bit. Now, fortunately enough for teenagers, all bets tended to be off, <laughs> and that's because of the drive-in theater. Now, I talked a lot about these a lot more when I went over my uh, blob uh, review. Yeah, there was a lover's lane. Yeah, absolutely. There was a place oftentimes uh, at the edge of town where you could go and make out. 
Uh, but that was about it. And even then, women were expected to, to tell you, to tell a man no. Uh, there was not going to be any sex involved. Uh, that was not happening at that time. Uh, for teenagers, it started to get a lot easier about that time because of the drive-in movie theater. In fact, this was right at the height of the drive-in movie theater. I talked about that quite a lot during my blog review, and I may pull that one out and make it into a clip because it's one of those things I can't talk about every single time that I talk about a drive-in movie. And this uh, very well would have been a drive-in movie theater fair, uh, but of course, of Frankenstein. Drive-in movie theaters, if you've never seen them, are pretty much exactly like it looks like in the picture. You would have all of these cars in what amounted to a big parking lot with a big screen at the front of it. And next to the cars, you would pull up next to it and there would be a post. And on that post would be a wired speaker. They were big, nasty things. The speaker's boxes themselves were larger than this. And um, probably easily that wide, the box themselves. Inside it was a little, small, tinny speaker that sounded like crap. And you would take it off the post and put it on your uh, on the inside of your car window, and that's how you'd listen to the movie. But that tended to leave be, leave the people who were running the movie theater with some amount of um, maintenance work to do, because people would oftentimes, I know I did more than once when they were still existed, I would back the car out without remembering to take the speaker off and consequently yank it out of the ground. Um, fortunately, by the time I really get uh, movie the outdoor theaters were still much of a thing when I was a teenager, they had transitioned over to using low power AM and FM uh, broadcast uh, frequencies. So you could then listen to this thing inside of your car on your stereo system rather than having to worry about this second speaker. But in 1957, that speaker was all they had. Yep, it was a big metal thing. Yeah, I don't even... I don't even nearby me have anything that large. It, those things were ginormous. Uh, they had volume controls on them, uh, well, a volume control. And as I say, it was all metal, and the speaker was small, and it rattled on the inside of that metal, and it was so tinny, uh, which is why having, you know, these nice stereo, you know, broadcast ones were so much better. I do have some uh, interesting anecdotes that go along with my own uh, drive-in movie uh, um, history, but again, that all sort of came out in that thing about the, uh, the blob, and I think what I'm going to do is pull that as its own clip so that I don't have to like constantly retell that story over and over again. Um, one thing about it was by the time I was a teenager, and they were still around at that time, they were starting to fade out, but they used to be a gigantic thing. Oh man, there were drive-ins everywhere. Any small town had them, big cities had them. Lincoln, Nebraska, which for the longest time when I was growing up was about 150,000, had three of the things, three of these drive-in theaters. And I think Larry Larry mentioned on um, the night I did the blob that they could have multiplexes where they had essentially kind of like a, a radial arm of different outdoor movie theaters with screens all in front of them. Uh, so they were really big and certainly were big at this time. It was the height of their popularity in 1957. So uh, there was one thing by the time you know, the thing about this was, the reason it was really popular with teenagers is it took the limits off of that social interaction thing. You were now ensconced in firmly in the confines of your own vehicle. So to some extent, you had a little bit more freedom in terms of what you could do in terms of physical contact with your date. It still was not the sort of thing where you would be expecting to necessarily get any sex, but making out, sure. And you would oftentimes also be the subject of pranks by your friends who might come by to try to find your car and disrupt you or embarrass you or something like that. Uh, yep, on the cheap land outside the city limits. That's where you used to find them, yes. And they had to do that, too, to some extent because of light pollution and the fact that you could not start a movie until it was starting to be dusk. You couldn't start a movie when it was too light outside, otherwise nobody would be able to see the screen. It had to be a dark. Um, by the time movie theaters, outdoor movie theaters were, you know, still a thing and starting to kind of be phased out when I was a teenager, it had changed a bit. An outdoor movie theater was damn near an excuse to have sex. If you went to a date with the theater, uh, to an outdoor movie, outdoor movie theater, there was some damn good possibility that sex was going to be involved. And in fact, by that time, a saying had come around, if the car is a rockin', don't come a knockin'. Or in any case, if the car windows were all fogged up, don't go coming around. 
But these are pretty much all gone now. There are some, a few around the country. I think there's still one in Omaha, Nebraska that uh, I have never gone to, but my understanding is, is that it's out there. But they're pretty much gone. And that's because, you know, home video, home video really just killed it. Because, you know, the, the, the selling point of the outdoor movie theater was that you were moving out of a packed theater and into the confines and comfort of your car. But if you can move out of the confines and comfort of your car to the confines and comfort of your living room, who cares? You know, especially since if you got, you know, a home video and you could just pop the VCR in and watch it there. I mean, why wait in line? Why to go to these things at all? So that's pretty much what killed them. That and big cities were cities were starting to expand outward and the land, as uh, Larry Larry mentions, on the edge of the city, uh, became less cheap. It became more valuable. Uh, in fact, two of the movie theaters here in Lincoln, Lincoln had grown in such a fashion as those two are now nothing but shopping space now because they, you know, they become malls uh, and because the real estate is just that much more valuable. So that was, oh God, everything is hitting me now. Instagram, Scott Adams is having a, having a uh, Periscope deal. Uh, so that was kind of the period. That was the time. That was the era when this movie came out. So it's worth talking about uh, the original novel. Now, any Frankenstein movie ultimately is based on Mary Shelley's original novel, Frankenstein or the Modern Prometheus, which was written by Mary Shelley. She was a British author and published in, on January of, 19, of 1818, rather. Now, this film doesn't really follow the novel, except in some very broad, outliney ways. Almost no film follows the novel, except in some broad, outliney ways. The only film that does not is 1994's Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, which was directed and starring Kenneth Branagh as Frankenstein and the director. And it also starred Robert De Niro as the creature and Helena Bonham Carter as Elizabeth and included quite a number of other A-list actors. Uh, but that is the only Frankenstein movie that I'm aware of that actually follows the novel pretty closely. Um, the novel's a little bit more complex and has a lot more going on to it that's hard to fit into two hours. And so they usually, you know, kind of st st pick up the pace and in this case made it a, a much less expensive uh, thing to shoot. Uh, if you want to see that one, I did watch that, uh, that uh, um, 2004 one, uh, more or less the same time I watched this one. It's, a, it's certainly a good movie, but very, very different from any other Frankenstein movie you're going to see. So much, much, much later, beginning of the 20th century, Universal came around and started making monster movies. Today they call it the Universal Classic Monsters, and they call it a franchise, although it was never really envisioned as such. It uh, basically was a bunch of fictional monsters um, that featured in a variety of horror, suspense, and science fiction movies made from Uni by Universal Studios and released from about the 1920s to about the 1950s. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, they began those films with the movies The Hunchback of Notre Dame and The Phantom of the Opera, which are both silent films and star Lon Chaney. They uh, later went on to do Dracula, Frankenstein, The Mummy, The Invisible Man, The Wolfman, and they even considered Creature from the Black Lagoon as part of this uh, classic modern, uh, classic monster movie franchise. And a lot of times these films would uh, star Bela Lugosi or Boris Karloff or Lon Chaney Jr. in some of their uh, better productions. However, by 1957, the steam had pretty much run out. What happened back then with monster movies was it's not like today where we have a franchise like the MCU. You know, this did not start out intending to be a franchise. It was just a bunch of monster movies. Universal found out they made a, few, a couple of them went, oh, we can make some money at this. Let's make some more. They never really intended to have crossovers. So when you saw crossovers in that period, that meant the steam was starting to run out. They realized, oh, we can't get people to come and watch these characters on their own. We have to maybe put two of them together and hope people will come and watch them then. And that's exactly what happened. Um, it, it was not a crossover in the sense that it was intended or planned or anything like that. It just meant that they'd started to run out of steam and people weren't coming to see the movies anymore. And then the crossovers ran out of steam. And when the crossovers ran out of steam, I mean, what happens today in almost any franchise when it starts to run out of steam, you go dark. 
you know, like Star Trek Discovery. Well, they think Star Trek has run out of steam, so they've gone dark. But when you're starting out with a monster movie that's kind of dark to start with, there's not much darker you can go without making something that nobody will go pay money for because it's just too horrific in that time period. Uh, Mary Shelley, as Larry Larry says, began writing Frankenstein when she was 19, published it year, a year later. Yeah, yeah. Uh, woman was brilliant. Um, that book, by the way, is in the public domain. I'll go out and find a, look, a link for it when I'm done, but it's on Project Gutenberg. You can read it. It's in, in its entirety in the public domain. As I say, nothing like any of the movies you've seen, with the exception of if you've seen the 2004 movie. But when the crossovers started to lose steam, that's when they made comedies. <laughs> they started making comedies. And uh, they did that with a series of Abbott and Costello movies. Now, if you don't know who Abbott and Costello were, they were a pair of uh, a, a really, really good stand-up guys. I mean, they did really good comedy. They made some good comedy movies. And so when the steam started running out, they made movies like Do Abbott and Costello Meet the Invisible Man, Abbott and Costello Meet Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, Abbott and Costello meet the mummy, stuff like that. You know, you just knew the steam was gone at that point. They had nothing left. In terms of Frankenstein, well, they made a lot of Frankenstein movies at uh, Universal. In 1931, they made the movie Frankenstein, which is a great movie. It is a really good one. I will review that one in 2021 for sure. In 1935, they made The Bride of Frankenstein, which isn't bad. It's not bad. I'll probably get to that one in 2025. 1939, they made The Son of Frankenstein. Uh, this is where they started um, you know, getting iffy on the, on the plots. I might review that in 2029. I don't see doing it any earlier than that. 1942, they made The Ghost of Frankenstein. This is when they were starting to get desperate. Depending on how desperate I am for reviews in 2022, I might, re I might review it then. 1943, they did the crossover movie, Frankenstein Meets the Wolfman. That's where the steam was starting to run out. And again, maybe in 2023, if I'm feeling desperate, I might do that one. 1944 had the House of Frankenstein. The best you can say about that one, I think, is it had some good actors in it. 1948, Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. Steam was gone at that point. And in 1949... This one I didn't know about till I was reviewing, until I did the research. 1949, Abbott and Costello meet the killer, Boris Karloff. Boris Karloff was the actor who played the monster in a lot of movies, sometimes played Frankenstein or one of his descendants. But they just said, ah, screw it, we can't do another one with, uh, with Frankenstein, so we'll just say we're meeting Boris Karloff himself. I have never seen this one. Uh, I doubt that I'll ever review it. Um, talk to me in 2029 if I'm that desperate yet. Uh, Larry, Larry says, Universal still show off their monsters in a comedic way at their parks. Yes, yes, they absolutely do. Yeah, unfortunately they do. But that was not the end of monster movies at uh, Universal. That came quite a lot later. And because... Fairly recently here in history, within the last, I guess, only five or six years, these idiots have come up with the dark universe. So what is this thing? Well, Universal saw the MCU going on, and they got desperate for some kind of franchise. And they said, aha, we have all of these monster movies. We can turn that into a franchise, not realizing that nobody really wants to watch that crap. They had a planned cinematic universe, and it was based on these classic Universal monster movies. It was a stupid idea. It was a stupid idea. It had Alex Kurtzman and Chris Morgan to uh, headline these stupid ideas. And I just have to always say to you guys, man, you know, I know you're desperate, but who green lights this crap? I mean, who thinks this is a good idea, for Christ's sake? You know, if... If you want, I will give you a shared universe that is original or nearly so. Or if we're going to get it from someone else, we're going to, you know, put on the screen something that's never been done. Say Larry Niven's known space universe, for example. Oh, I shouldn't have given you the idea. Now you want to do it. But you come to me, man. Come to the Fandai Master. I will get you something that people will watch. And it won't necessarily cost you a ton of cash. We can start out, or you know, simply and easily like they did with Iron Man. And if that flies, we can work up to bigger budget movies and wind up making Ringworld at some point. 
So, you know, universal, you morons, call me. The uh, Dark Universe was uh, going to involve these films. In, 19, in 2014, rather, they released Dracula Untold. That was supposed to be the first in their Dark Universe. And it tanked at the box office and was critically panned. And they sort of said, whoops, hold on, wait a minute. Let's make that not part of this universe. Then in 2017, they released The Mummy, which tanked at the box office and was critically panned. And that caused such problems that even though they had basically finished making The Bride of Frankenstein. They pulled its initial release date. It still has no release date. Kurtzman and Morgan left, and Universal has put a hold on future projects while they create a plan for future releases. Guys, nobody wants to watch it. Call me. Fortunately enough, fortunately enough, however, 1957 rolled around. And Hammer Films came along. Now, Hammer is, it still exists, a British film company that's based in London. It was founded in 1934. I didn't know it went that far back until I did the research. Best known for these movies that were made in the 1950s and 60s, usually with monster movies. And a lot of them used the same classic, uh, you know, monsters as Universal. But all of these monsters are in the public domain, so there's no reason they can't make them. There's no reason you can't make them. There's no reason fan films can't go out and make them, and I encourage them to. They uh, included Frankenstein, Count Dracula, The Mummy, and the biggest thing that, that Hammer did differently, the, well, not the biggest, but one of the biggest things that they did differently was these were the first time these movies were being seen in color. And I might add vivid color. Um, this is something we don't see a lot, and I'll talk about that some when it comes to the cinematography on this. We don't often see movies that are made with this level of really bright coloring in it. And so that was a big change. And so doing that for the first time w was a significant novelty for these films. They had previously from Universal all been done in black and white. Basically, Hammer took the torch of making good horror films from Universal. They had a better and newer take on it, and they could still make these movies where Universal had completely run out of steam and nobody knew what to do with them anymore. Hammer also produced some science fiction, thrillers, uh, film noirs, and comedies, and in their later years, they actually did television shows, although it was not so, uh, uh, that was news to me as well. Uh, during their most successful period, which basically started with this film, uh, they really dominated the horror industry, and they had a lot of worldwide success and a lot of financial success. Uh, the worldwide success was largely due to the fact that they had partnerships with American United States studios. So, for example, The Curse of Frankenstein that I'm reviewing tonight was actually released by Warner Brothers. Um, by the way, they copied, claimed the copyright on all of last night's show, based on I mean, last week's show, rather, based on the trailer that I showed for that show. Next week, The Revenge of Frankenstein was released by Columbia Studios, who will no doubt claim the copyright on this week's show based on the uh, trailer that I'm going to show for that movie at the end. But during the 1960s and 1970s, uh, the horror film market started to become more uh, saturated. You started to see some more of the monsters that we are getting to be more familiar with today, and in fact that have gotten old and have now been rehashed over and over. And because of that, they lost the American funding, and they had to change the way they were doing things, and pretty much it went all down the tubes for them by about the mid-1980s. However, and I did not know this until I looked it up, in 2000, the studio was sold to a consortium who announced plans to do more movies, but none were ever produced. And then in 2007, the company was sold again to another consortium, and they did release movies. In 2010, they released the film Let Me In, 2011, The Resident, 2012, The Woman in Black, and in 2014, The Quiet Ones. So Hammer is still out there. Uh, if you look for their current logo, it doesn't look anything like this. Um, it's actually kind of cool, but it doesn't look anything like that. So, in terms of a non-spoiler review that I can do for this, uh, I would say that this is a really good movie. I like this movie a lot for many reasons. It'll become clear as I go talking through about it. In some ways, I think that it is, in fact, even better than some of the old uh, Universal ones because it gets rid of some of the stupid. Some of those had stuff that, you know, even today, uh, maybe back then, I'm not sure about back then, but certainly today we find a little dumb. And uh, the horror, Hammer films kind of did away with some of that. 
Alien 1979 was the first modern horror movie. Yeah, that's certainly that's partly true, uh, Captain Jesse. But there were also how oh, things like um, what is it, Blackenstein, I think, which was a black exploitation film where. Blackula, that's it. Yeah, Blackula. That came along in the 70s. There were a bunch of those, you know, kind of exploitation films that came in then. And well, when you're the only name in, in name in town and you're doing these monster movies, that's one thing. But when you have to start competing with stupid stuff like that, it all kind of goes to hell. Uh, they didn't quite have the steam run out of them the same way that Universal did. It's just that there were other options to be had. So. Yep, Christopher Peter Cushing and Christopher Lee, Larry Larry says, made these better and popular. Absolutely. Yes, Peter Cushing in this one and Christopher Lee as Dracula in a later ones that I'll be reviewing oh, probably next year. Um, anyway, I think this is really good. Uh, it's better in some ways, I think, because it takes out some of the stupid um, and it's in color. And, and the, the fact that this was intentionally in color and this very, very vivid kind of color uh, that we do not see in movies today. You know, it, color was not brand new in 1957, but it was new for these monsters. And you still saw it in movies of that time period. If you go back and you look at them, you notice that the color really kind of pops out at you because of the way you know, it was shot and the colors that were used. Uh, we don't see that much today, um, particularly when you get into, you know, like DC's stupid, uh, you know, f uh, film universe where they, you know, s uh, desaturate everything so badly. It's almost like watching a Batman movie for everything. But but these were very, very colorful. And again, I'll talk about that some when I get to the cinematography about this. So at this point, I can issue me a... Uh, Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. All hands. Prepare for incoming spoilers. Yes, it is a spoiler alert. And as always, it is because I am the fan that I am master, and that means that the fandom is strong with me. And that means that nothing is new, nothing is original, and at worst I figure it out about half an hour early. This is unfortunately not a bow story brag. This is where you find yourself after having watched, read, and listened to about a hundred years worth of science fiction. You just can't see all the new stuff for the century that went before, and sometimes it inhibits your ability to enjoy things. Not so much with this film, and that was mostly because... I hate to say it, being the fan die master, but I have never watched the Hammer films through in their entirety. I've seen some selected scenes that are considered very classic, but I have never seen them all the way through. So when I go to review these, I'm going to be watching those for the first time as well. So that's going to be kind of nice. Yes, Larry, Larry, Technicolor, very, very vivid colors. You know, not people look at the original Star Trek series and, you know, they're wearing all those very bright colors. Well, that was because color was new on TV and they were doing bright colors and technicolor at that time was bright colors so we see that in this film uh, very very bright and vivid colors so uh, the plot on this one it is 19th century Switzerland, and Baron von Frankenstein is in prison awaiting execution for a murder and he tells his story, his life story, uh, to a visiting priest who he's had to come talk to him. So the entire rest of the film, with the exception of the last five minutes, is now in flashback. So way back when, uh, Frankenstein's mother, she died and left young Frankenstein, so to speak, young Frankenstein, another movie entirely, uh, in control of the family fortune, which, by the way, I will review that for you at some point. When it hits its anniversary, I will do that one. Uh, she leaves him in control of the family fortune. His father is already dead. And so uh, one of the things you see early on is he's going to agree to continue to pay uh, one of his aunts a monthly allowance. That was not at all unusual back then. The way that fortunes accrued up until more or less the beginning of the United States and even into it was that the eldest male got the money. He was, however, expected and required to pay the female members of his family up until such time as they got married. This allowed the family fortune to accumulate over many generations and at the same time kept people in pretty good money. And so that was what was going on with his aunt here. And also will help his cousin Elizabeth, whom his aunt says at that point is, would make a very good wife. Okay, going to put on the brakes there for a second. Elizabeth is his cousin, 
And yes, they are ultimately going to be engaged to be married. And that was not unusual at the time for aristocracy. The aristocracy was all about keeping the titles and the money in the family. Uh, and so it was not shockingly unusual for someone in the aristocracy, aristocracy, particularly someone who held a title like baron, to marry someone within their own family, a cousin or second cousin or something like that. This did lead to inbreeding. Um, there is some indication that King George, at the time of the American Revolution, his mental illness may have been a result of inbreeding of that royal family. Because it did, and if you ever hear the term blue blood, well, that actually refers in a roundabout way to inbreeding in the aristocracy. So it did happen, and that was not unusual at this time for somebody to, you know, marry somebody like that. In fact, I don't think a viewer, if you are in Britain watching this in 1957, would have even thought twice about that. You know, it sticks out as us now as being totally weird because it's like, wait, marry your cousin? Uh, that's a recipe for disaster. You know, we only we only talk about that these days in terms of somebody we really want to, you know, insult, you know, marrying your cousin. But aristocracy used to do that all the time. So soon after his mother's death, Victor engages a man named Paul Kremp to tutor him. And after several years of intense study, Victor learns everything he can from Kremp. And then the duo start collaborating on scientific experiments. And one night, one fateful night, after successfully doing an experiment in which they brought a dead dog back to life, Victor suggests that the next step should be to create a perfect human being from body parts. Well, Kramp assists Victor at first, but eventually uh, withdraws because he's unable to cope with the notion of constantly going around and ripping off people's remains, particularly after Victor's fiance, the now grown, uh, uh, Elizabeth uh, comes to live with Victor uh, in preparation for their getting married. Um, so, uh, Kremp does stay around because while he does not approve of what Victor is now doing, he doesn't feel like he can leave Elizabeth there by herself because he's afraid something bad will happen and so he wants to stay around to try to protect her. And on several occasions he tries to get her to um, leave Baron Frankenstein but can't really tell her why. You know, how do you tell some woman that, you know, her fiancé is up in the attic working on horrific experiments? You know, how do you say that to somebody? Uh. <clears throat> Pardon me, tail end of a uh, sinus infection this week. Last week I was getting it. This is the tail end. Um, but um, so now Kremp's not working with him, but Frankenstein continues to assemble his creation. He, they use a uh, robber's corpse that had been hung from a gallows and left there. And then they find hands and eyes that they purchase at what amounted to a morgue back then. And just by, you know, bribing what amounted to the mortician at that point for the body parts. Not that difficult, really. And for the brain, however, Victor wants to seek out an aging and distinguished professor so the monster can have a sharp mind and a lifetime full of information to start with rather than having to be something that has to be taught. So he invites this professor over to his house in the guise of a friendly visit and then pushes the guy off of the uh, top of a railing, killing him in what seems to be an accident to anyone but professor, but uh, Frankenstein. After the professor is buried, Victor then proceeds to the vault. He's got him buried in his family vault, out of a courtesy, of course. Um, and then tries to remove his brain, removes his brain. And uh, Kremp stops him, tries to stop him. There's a scuffle, and the brain falls and is damaged. Kremp then again pr tries to persuade Elizabeth to leave the house, but again she refuses. And now, with all of his parts assembled, Frankenstein brings the creature to life. Unfortunately, the creature's brain, having been damaged, it probably has no memory of the murder, which is, I would think, a good thing all around. But in any case, it's left violent, psychotic, and without the uh, professor's intelligence. Frankenstein locks it up, but it escapes and eventually heads out into the countryside where it kills an old blind man in the woods. Kremp and Victor then go out looking for it, and Kremp shoots the thing with a shotgun in the head, uh, killing it, and he and Victor bury it. For some weird reason, Kremp thinks that that's going to be the end of it. 
because, I mean, it's not like they haven't brought this thing back to life already. And Kremp decides, okay, well, Elizabeth's no longer in any danger. I'm going to leave. Well, of course, Frankenstein digs the thing back up and brings it back to life again. Uh, he then, oh, well, this is a fun one. This is another thing that I don't think viewers of that time would have thought twice about when it comes to the aristocracy. Throughout most of this time, uh, prior to Elizabeth showing up, uh, Frankenstein has been carrying on with his maid, Justine, apparently promising her to marry her at some point, making her the next Baroness Frankenstein, which would be a huge step up from a maid, and clearly having sex with her. But now that Elizabeth is around, there is no pretense of doing that anymore. I don't think this would have surprised anyone who is familiar with, uh, you know, aristocracy in Britain at the time. Um, you know, mistresses were not all that unusual. But at this point, she claims that she is pregnant and she threatens to tell the authorities about uh, Frankenstein's experiments if he does not marry her. And he says he won't. She goes up to his lab and he basically lets the monster kill her. Paul then returns to the house at Elizabeth invitation when they're uh, going to have a, uh, 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 it's basically a party announcing their engagement or something. Uh, and uh, so, oh, it's the evening before, it's the evening before she and Victor are going to be married. And uh, uh, Victor shows Paul this revived monster. And Paul says, that's it. I'm going down to the village and get the authorities and you're going to be taken away, Victor. But there is a scuffle that follows, and the creature escapes the castle to its roof, where he threatens Elizabeth, who has gone in now after finding this door unlocked. She goes into the uh, um, lab and starts looking around, and the creature takes her up to threaten at her. Uh, Victor shoots the creature, attempts to shoot him, but uh, accidentally hits Elizabeth, but not fatally. He hits her in the shoulder or something, I'm not sure. And uh, Victor then throws an oil lantern at the creature, setting it on fire, and it falls through the skylight into a convenient bath of acid that Victor keeps around. We see it early. It pay it's a payoff. It's a payoff. It's a good one. Uh, we see it earlier where he drops things, body parts, into it that he wants to get rid of, and it just dissolves them away. So the creature falls in there and apparently dissolves away into nothingness and leaves uh, no proof that it ever existed. Victor is then imprisoned for the murder of his maid, Justine. And then finally out of the flashback. <laughs> Remember that whole thing was flashback to where he was talking with a priest? Well, the priest doesn't believe him, not surprisingly. And then Kremp comes to visit him in jail, and Frankenstein begs him to tell him, hey, this was real, the creature was real, it was him who killed Justine and not me. But Kremp, you know, not really having any uh, sympathy left for Frankenstein at this point, refuses to do so and says he doesn't know anything about what this guy's raving about. And uh, Kremp leaves uh, Frankenstein and joins Elizabeth, basically saying there's nothing we can do for him now. At which point, Frankenstein is led away to the guillotine and uh, seen. Note that he's only led away to the guillotine. We do not see him guillotined. He's simply led away. So keep that in mind for next week. <laughs> In terms of the story here, in terms of cringe moments, you know, to be honest, I don't really have any. Um, if I had any, it might be related to the low budget. Um, there is a radical difference between what you can see of Frankenstein's castle and all of that in the interior, uh, as opposed to like the 2004 movie. But the 2004 movie had a zark ton o budget. This one was very low budget, and I'll talk about just how low in a minute, um, and why it does not hit me so much as a cringe moment not being able to see more of this interior of what should have been a very upscale uh, you know ar aristocrats castle in terms of great moments well pretty much everything in the film um, you have to look through it as I'll explain here in a bit through the prism of a film made with a very low budget and once you do, you discover that it's a very, very well-made film and the story flows very well considering what they had money to do. The writers on the film, Mary Shelley is credited as uh, b based on the classic story by, although again, the degree to which it's based is a very, a very tenuous. You get, again, some of the basic stuff. There's a guy named Frankenstein. He creates a monster. Um, and there are other things that are a little bit closer to the, you know, the book in this than are in some other films, but not much, not much. It does not follow the book too much. However, the guy who is responsible for the screenplay is uh, uh, Jimmy Sangster. 
Now, here's a guy whose IMDb goes 1956 to 2000 with 74 writing credits and was generally in film until about 1972 and then TV after that. The Curse of Frankenstein was his third credit, and he went on to write a lot of Hammer's uh, horror films, probably for the same reason he did this one. Um, this was a guy who had uh, worked previously as a production designer and a production manager, and he knew that they had a very small fracking budget. This was, in modern dollars, a, an under $1 million budget film, well under $1 million budget film. So he knew how to write this in a way that still worked, you know, even though it was a low-budget film by today's standards. I mean, it was, it was low-budget always, but if you convert its budget into modern standards, it's well over a million dollars, under a million dollars. So the fact that you could do a movie like this meant, you know, you had to have good people all the way around, starting out with your writer, who knew not to write stupid stuff, but knew how to write inside of a small budget, and he does. And this is his third credit. He went on to write many of Hammer's films, again, because of, I think he could write low-budget films like this. In terms of his awards now, as I always say, you know, Oscars are okay, Emmys are nice, but if you really want to impress me, the one you got to win in science fiction to really impress me is the Hugo Award. And in fact, he did win the Hugo Award a year later in 1959 for Dracula, which I will be reviewing. That one stars, um, <laughs> that one stars Christopher Lee as Dracula. Here, uh, eh, the reason he gets cast, I'll talk about that more in a minute, but the one in Dracula he does really, really good at. Um, uh, uh, Jimmy Sangster also won the uh, Academy of Science Fiction, uh, Fantasy, and Horror Films Award in 1977, a Lifetime Golden uh, Scroll Achievement Award. In terms of his writing here, again, he knew he was writing for a limited budget. He knew he couldn't have a jillion characters. He knew he couldn't have villagers coming and storming like the you know, Universal films often did. It was a low-budget, very low-budget film, and he knew that going in, and so he was able to write a really pretty decent script given that he could only use a few characters, and there aren't that many characters in this movie, not really, and a limited number of locations. I think there are, there's maybe one shooting location uh, on this one and a very limited number of sets. He could not write lots of sets into this one, so... I think he does a really excellent job of writing a Frankenstein film on an extremely limited budget. Um, I have no qualms with his writing here whatsoever. I think he does a great job on a very limited budget. You know, this could have been um, a complete cluster frack. You know, this could have been Plan 9 from Outer Space, um, but it wasn't. It had a good writer. <laughs> You know, where Plan 9 started out as a low-budget film, well, the biggest thing it had problems with is it had a schlock auteur writer slash director slash, well, producer. This guy, on the other hand, was not schlock. He knew what he was doing. He was, he was a good writer, and he wrote a good Frankenstein movie for a very low budget. He's one of the few people in here that, we, that does, in fact, have a six degrees of Star Trek because he did an episode of The Six Million Dollar Man in the 1970s, and The Six Million Dollar Man was produced by Harv Bennett, who would go on to produce Star Trek's two through five. Our characters in this film. Oh, man, Peter Cushing. Peter Cushing as Victor Frankenstein. As I said last week, I tried to find pictures now that are more contemporaneous to our current day rather than when they were making the film, because you can see that in the film. Uh, this is uh, one of his later pictures. Um, his INDB is 1939 to 1986. Now, I always like to point out these guys, you know, especially for newer viewers who don't know. I like to point out people who have decent number of acting credits like this because when you have 131 acting credits over roughly a 40-year period, 40-45 year period, you're in a very elite group of actors ones who are always working, ones who are making money acting. Most actors don't make dime one acting. Most actors wait tables, take classes, and audition a lot, if as much as humanly possible. Most of the time, they are never cast. There are hundreds of thousands of actors out there in Hollywood and elsewhere 
that you will never hear about other than being the guy that you tipped for waiting your table. Um, they will never do anything with the career, not because of any necessarily any fault of their own. A lot of times in uh, theater, it's as much a question of luck as anything else. But in this case, we have a guy with 131 acting credits. That means he was working. He was a worker, working, 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 working. Anytime you see somebody, I usually figure if you're getting more than one role a year, one or more roles per year, you are now up there in the elite. You know, when I was acting, I made a grand total one year of $1,200 at my craft. That was big with the actors that I knew. Most of them didn't even make that. So that was a success story at 1200 bucks a year. Uh, Peter Cushing, he went on, um, he, he did almost exclusively film, and of course science fiction fans remember him probably best as Grand Moff Tarkin in the original Star Wars movie in 1977, or as the CGI face of Grand Moff Tarkin in Rogue One. He won a fair number of awards. He won the BAFTA in 1956 for Best Actor. He won the Fantasporo in 1984 for Best Actor, although that one was basically a Lifetime Achievement Award. He won the Sitges Catalonian, sorry, Catalonian International Film Festival Award in 1976 for Best Actor for The Ghoul, and again in 1983 for Best Actor for House of the Long Shadows. In terms of his performance, I like his performance a lot. He is a classically trained British actor, and it shows, it shows, it shows, it shows, it shows. As with any bad guy, any protagonist in a movie, you cannot approach that role as if the guy is a bad guy. A bad guy always thinks they're a good guy in their own head. You know, it's it's just the same. It's one of the reasons Thanos works so well as a bad guy. He's a good guy in his own head. Everything he thinks he's doing, he's doing for a reason. It makes perfect sense to him, and it's a good reason. Same thing with Frankenstein. He's a driven scientist who is driven past the point of being too rational about it. And even when he kills somebody, he thinks he's doing it for totally rational reasons. He's got a, an old man, a very intelligent old man who's at the end of his life in Frankenstein's mind, he thinks he's giving him a new lease on life. He's going to wake up in this new body and he'll be able to carry on his work for another, you know, 50 years or so. So even as a bad guy, even as a murderer, you know, he is still a good guy in Frankenstein's own mind. And, you know, he, Peter Cushing is very, very good at playing that. Just no question about it. Very good at it. Um, Bought him the whole time. You know, he's such a good villain that for most of the movie, up until the murder, uh, I was sympathetic to him. You know, I thought Kremp is... I mean, I know where the story is headed. You can't not know where a Frankenstein story is headed. Um, but as a character, I thought, well, you know, under the circumstances, I think maybe Kremp is a little wrong here. You know, he's just being a little, um, you know, he's thinking about this more from a religious perspective rather than a scientific one, which is where I tend to come from it. And from that perspective, I thought, okay, well, Frankenstein's maybe not such a bad guy. And then he killed the guy. And you're like, okay, well, he's not such a good guy. But he did it for reasons that made perfect sense to him. And there's a lot of subtext that he's playing. You have to play subtext. You can't just look at what's on the lines and play that. You have to play what's going on under the lines. And there's a number of those when I get to direction in one particular point where I'll talk about that. But he plays a lot of good subtext, classically trained actor, and it shows here. He does a great performance. He does a great performance of a heavy that does not feel like a heavy. As his cousin Elizabeth is Hazel Court, who had an IMDb that ran 1944 to 1981 with 73 acting credits. Again, about a 40-year career, a 35-year career, and was working. She did largely film until about 1957 here, and then she did TV much, pretty much afterwards with multiple TV series and multiple regulars. No awards. Um, her performance, uh, she also seems to me probably to be a classically trained British actor. The difference is her character. Unlike Frankenstein, who's fairly nuanced, she is not given a whole hell of a lot to do. She is grateful and supportive of Victor Frankenstein because of all the years that she's been taking care she's been taking care of her. And she is uh, loyal to him because of that. 
and you know you don't really get the impression that they're in love at any time but at this time romantic love for aristocrats in particular was not necessarily why you got married you got married for the sake of maybe putting together two different aristocracies together or in this case because it was the right thing to do because he had kept t taken care of her all those years so in that respect she's perfectly fine the actress plays that perfectly fine there are moments when i think it's bordering on the theatrical um, when she's getting upset with Kremp, when he's telling her she needs to leave she'll do things like you know look away and do things like that <sighs> you know that are just more theatrical than they are seeming really organic and she'll pop back from that you know instantaneously without you know any blinking an eye that sometimes seems a little bit forced to me but again she was not given the same kind of character you know she was given somebody who ultimately was there to um, be somebody who's kind of in the way of getting these experiments done and uh, is somebody that has to be threatened at the end um, but for what she's got She's perfectly fine. I don't have much of any problems with her performance. Then, as Paul Kremp, and I could not find a current picture for him, and the only one I could find was so bad I didn't want to put it up, um, is uh, Robert Urquhart. IMDb is um, 1950 to 1994 with 123 acting credits, so another worker. He did largely television, but mostly British series that we would never have heard of. But he did do multiple regulars on those series. No awards won. Uh, in terms of his performance here, I find it fine. I don't... Uh, you know, the thing about it is, you got Peter Cushing on the screen with you. Cushing kind of runs away with the show. <laughs> um, he does a good performance, don't get me wrong. He does a fine performance. And I'm particularly... I like him when he is being... Um, conflicted about what to tell Elizabeth right he wants her to get out because he knows this could be dangerous for her but by the same token he can't just blurt out oh your fiance is making a monster upstairs you know that how do you do that and have it come away I mean she's not going to believe him if he tells her that but he's trying to figure out what can I say to her to get her to go but I can't tell her the truth so in that respect I think he's playing that subtext pretty well um Again, not quite as much for him to do as a character. He's the guy that's there to say, Victor, you're blowing it big time. You shouldn't be doing this. You know, we got to get your fiance out of here and all that. Um, so not as much for him to do as a character. But I totally believe him. I totally believe him the whole time. So no problem with his character there. And then we have the creature himself, played by Christopher Lee. Christopher Lee was born in 1922, died in 2015, and his IMDb is 1956 to 2017, giving him two posthumous credits, The Hunting of the Snark as the narrator, and also the narrator in a uh, film called The Time War, which uh, is in post right now, so that's going to be even after, <laughs> you know, it'll be 2018 or 2019 when that comes out. He has an IMDb that has 280 acting credits. He is not the record on this show. That was set by someone else a few weeks ago. <laughs> but he, uh, he's definitely up there. This was a guy who was working, 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 working. Um, he did largely film with some TV series with multiple regulars in Britain. Starred in a number of Hammer films. Um, he played Dracula very, very well, very effectively, as we'll see when I get to that movie. And m most recently, fans will probably remember him as being Saruman in Lord of the Rings and Count Dooku in the Star Wars prequels. Sadly, that's what modern fans will remember him for, despite the fact that he's got a rather enormous body of work that dates back long before then. The guy won about a bajillion awards. Um, most of them were some variation of a Lifetime Achievement Award. So, for example, in 2011, he won the Academy Fellowship Award for BAFTA. He won the Career Life Award from the American Science Fiction uh, uh, Academy of Science Fiction, Fantasy, and Horror Films in 1979. He won the Awards Circuit Community Award in 2001 for the Best Cast Ensemble and for Lord of the Rings, The Fellowship of the Ring. That is not the, first, the last time we'll hear a award like that come up. 
He won a Lifetime Achievement Award from Braun Stoker Awards in 1995, a BFI Fellowship, which is essentially a Lifetime Achievement Award, from British Film Institute Awards in 2013, a Capri a Legend Award in 2007, a Cinema for Peace Awards in 2013, for the film Mandela, The Long Walk Home, about Nelson Mandela. He won a Career Honorary Award from the Cineforia Awards. He won a Lifetime Achievement Award in 2002 for the Empire Awards. He won a Lifetime Achievement in 2002 for the Evening Standard British Film Awards. A Career Award in 1993 from Fanta Festival. A Lifetime Best Actor Award in 1994 from, Fa- from Fantaspora. The Festrolia, Festrolia rather, Troya International Film Festival 2007 Golden Dolphin Career Award. A Lifetime Achievement Award in 2006 from Jewel, for the Jules Verne Awards. The Festival President's Award, which is essentially a Lifetime Achievement Award in 2008 for the Car, uh, from the Karlovy Vary International Film Festival. Another Excellence Award in 2013 from the London Film Critics Circle Awards. Again, basically just a Lifetime Achievement Award. And in 1994, yet another one, the Delise Powell Awards from the London Critics Fil- Circle Film Awards and Lifetime Achievement Award. And this was one that kind of blew my mind. In, uh, they won the MTV and T- uh, Movie and TV Awards in, in 2003 for Best Fight from Star Wars Episode Two: Attack of the Clones. Okay. I know how that one was done. It was just his face over somebody else's body. Not quite sure how you get an award for being a superimposed CG face, but he did. (laughs) He won the Phoenix Film Critics Society Awards in 2002 and 2003, both for Best Acting Ensemble, first for The Lord of the Rings, The Fellowship of the Rings, and then for The Lord of the Rings, The Two Towers won the Living Treasure Award from the SFX Awards in 2003, won the Best Actor in 1983 from the Seattle Film Critics Award for The House of Shadows. And that is his lengthy series of awards. Again, as you can see, quite a number of career and lifetime achievement awards involved in there. Not surprising. The guy was around forever, did a ton of work, and very well known for things you know beyond just Count Dooku, which is... Sadly, all that modern fans must remember him for. Um, his performance here. Um, it, 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 the documentation that I went and looked up all says that he got this largely because he's a tall guy. He's like six, seven or something like that. And they wanted somebody tall to play the monster. He actually wasn't the first choice. <laughs> he got this because he was tall. Um, his performance, there's not much to it. You know, he he lumbers around. He kills a couple of people. Um, He has to act like he's been shot, um, you know, like he's got bad things going on. But but really, uh, the character doesn't depend so much on his acting skills as it does the makeup more than anything else. So it's fine for what he does. It's fine. Um, I do think, however, that this probably gave him an in to playing Dracula a year later and boy was he good at that get to that one next year when that one's anniversary rolls around so you know hey uh, whether or not he intended to have this role for it was intended that he have the role for any other reason than he was tall well it certainly gave him an in to do something much better the year next year now I'm going to mention this because again there's not too many characters in this film um, and that's intentional not a lot of money Uh, But we have a guy that I'm going to mention here because of what I felt about his performance. Um, Young Victor Frankenstein is played by Melvin Hayes. Now, he's another guy, a worker. IMDb goes 1953 to 2018 to present. He has 108 acting credits with T.I.M. This Is Me in in pre-production, rather. He has done multiple TV series with multiple regulars, largely British television productions. And I mention him here because I like his performance. I don't know how old he was. I didn't look it up how old he was when they did this. Um, But uh, he hadn't been acting very long, only about four years. And he comes off as a perfectly believable young Victor Frankenstein. I perfectly believe him as a young Peter Cushing. And more than that, I I believe his general um, attitude towards being an aristocrat. This is a kid who would have been trained from birth 
that he is going to be the next Baron Frankenstein, that he is going to have certain aristocratic um, responsibilities, that he's going to be responsible for this fortune, that he's going to have to do things and be a responsible person. And he comes off as that, if a, if a bit standoffish at first, he comes off as that. He really does come off as that to me as somebody who is legitimately playing what could be a younger Peter Cushing and, uh, you know, pulling off this notion of being an aristocrat. So I liked his performance there. That's why I mentioned him here. He isn't there for very long. Um, it's mostly montage sequences. But he comes off in the non-montage stuff perfectly believable to me. So I, I liked his performance a lot, which is why I mentioned him. Uh, let see if I can find my picture. Then, as the... Uh, Income from what business? Oh, uh, I, I don't know that there necessarily would have been an income from a business. This would have been a fortune accumulating over a long period of time, handed down from one baron to the next, to the next, to the next. Um, it was just old money. It was just aristocratic money. Uh, I don't know for sure if the I don't know for sure if the uh, aristocracy at that point would have been expected to have a business. You know, today. Uh, British aristocracy is more than just a title. You do, in fact, usually hold a lot of visitors or at least stock in them. Uh, back then, I'm not sure that that necessarily would have been necessary. You would have been accumulating, as I say, this fortune over a long period of time, you know, maybe investments or something like that, but largely just accumulating this fortune over centuries. So I don't know that necessarily there was a business. But he was certainly going to be responsible for a fortune, responsible for running a castle household and so forth, and having to uh, basically, it being sort of required that he marry his cousin because of the relationship and all that, keeping this all in the family. So. As Justine, the, uh, the maid, we have Valerie Gaunt, another person I could not find much of a uh, contemporary film picture from, but that's not surprising. She only had four acting roles between 1956 and 58. Um, uh, of the ones she did for Hammer, she did Horror of Dracula, and that one she's got a much bigger role in, by the way, um, and uh, gets to show off a little bit more of what she did. Here, um, again, character... You know, she's she's this woman that Victor is carrying on with, that he is stringing along, and when she realizes that she has he has been stringing her along, she gets pretty okay. Well, that's it. I'm gonna you know, I'm gonna find some dirt on you, and uh, is pretty straightforward about that. So, you know, she is fine. She does fine with that, and has frankly, and I'm not sure that this didn't contribute to her being cast, has one of the most blood curdling screams I have ever heard just before somebody gets killed. So, uh, Super Crew 63 says, mostly land and farming. Yeah, they lease land property. Yeah, I sh it's tr yeah, 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 yeah. That's, uh, that's a lot of it. They, it was still tied to, um, you know, this sort of peasant farming thing. They would have a large tract of land that they owned, and they would lease that out for farming and take a big chunk, owe the money, uh, straight skimmed straight off the top from those people that were uh, farming on their land. Um, so we can get out of this and into the production aspects of this. A little bit of trivia. As I mentioned, this is a low-budget film. In 1957, this was made for $85,000 uh, um, in U.S. dollars. If you move that up, and adjust for inflation, that would be about $760,000 today. Well, I mean, it wasn't even a three-quarter of a million dollar movie. I mean, or barely a three-quarter of a million dollar movie. This was a very, very low budget then and now. Very low budget film. And when taking that into account, you go, wow, they made a pretty damn good film for a three-quarter of a million dollar movie you know, in today's dollars. Interesting thing, it does have a little bit of a checkered history. There was a producer named Max Rosenberg who originally went to Hammer with this idea. Um, he wanted to produce a film called Frankenstein and the Monster. And uh, he claims that he came up with that title with a script from a guy named Milton Subotsky. However, they were both let go out of the production, making only $5,000 uh, for bringing their production to Hammer. They later started their own film company, Amicus Films, which was something of a competitor to Hammer. 
the screenwriter on this, uh, Jimmy Sangster, um, he uh, d doesn't appear to have ever actually read the script that those two guys brought in or was even aware of their involvement. Um, he had, as I mentioned, Sangster, the, the guy who wrote the script, had been a production manager, and so he knew that he had a very limited fracking budget, and he knew that he had to write to a limited fracking budget, and that he couldn't write big, giant scenes. He couldn't write big, giant sets like you might see in a castle like this in real life. He couldn't write lots and lots of characters. He had to keep it small and had to keep it intimate, and he does a very good job. Um, he says, in fact, there was an interview that he did with somebody where he said that he'd never even actually seen any of the Frankenstein films that uh, were produced by Universal. Um, he just looked at the book and he adapted it the way he saw it, which I think was a really good thing. Um, it took out some of the stupid. You know, you don't have an Igor character running around. It is a bit closer to the film in that regard. There's no Igor in the, in the book. You know, it, there is um, Frankenstein... In the book and in the 2004 film, Frankenstein is actually a medical student when he's coming up with all this stuff, and he has friends who have figured out what he's doing and think it's horrifying. Um, so it's not quite the same, but it's the same sort of dynamic. Um, Peter Cushing, by the way, this was his first lead role in a film. He'd been doing um, roles in TV in British television, but this was his first lead part in a movie at this point. Uh, Christopher Lee, as I mentioned, he was cast largely because he was five foot, six foot five inches tall. There was another guy, Bernard Breslau, who was almost considered for the role. He was six foot seven. Basically, they just needed somebody who was tall. Universal had fought pretty hard on this to make sure that Hammer did not use any aspects of their 1931 or later films. Um, they could not use anything like the makeup that you see. Uh, in those uh, Universal monster movies. You could not use that makeup. That was an infracking possibility to use that makeup. Um, so the uh, makeup artist, whom well, I'll talk about in a minute, Phil Leakey, uh, he had to design a completely new set of makeup uh, to go along with this. Half a second I'm checking to uh, make sure that I'm still live and I'm not buffering. Looks like I'm just buffering on my local machine here. So, um, And the makeup I'll talk about in a bit. Um, but it had to bear no resemblance whatsoever to the Boris Karloff makeup at all. Film opened at the London Pavilion on May 2nd, 1957 with an X certificate from the censors. Now, so that you know what that means. From 1951 to 1970, what that meant was this was a film suitable for those aged 16 and over. So it was much more similar to what our, 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 our rating is today um, or traditionally has been. Um, but, uh, you know, considering the subject matter and all that, at the time that makes sense. You know, back then they used to still in the United States have G-rated movies, which you never see now. It's always PG, PG-13 just to start with. Uh, but they used to have general audience movies, <laughs> as if the PG and PG-13 ratings even matter, or the R rating for that matter. I think, I'm not sure the NC-17 rating matters anymore. Who the hell knows? So the guy who was directing this was uh, Terrence Fisher. Uh, his IMDb is 1936 to 1991 with 64 director credits, 18 editor credits, almost all film, and uh, lots of horror, particularly for Hammer. He would go on to do a lot of Hammer horror movies. As always, you want to impress me? Forget about the Oscars. Forget about the Emmys. Win yourself a Hugo, which he did in 1959 for Dracula. For Hammer again. I like his direction a lot. Again, you were dealing with a low-budget film, one that could not have large sets, and you could not pull out too much from what they, excuse me, what they had. Otherwise, it would become obvious that you were dealing with a small set. So he makes a lot of very effective use of close-ups. There is one in particular that sticks with me because uh, Frankenstein is using what amounts to an ancient sort of stethoscope to listen for a heartbeat from the dog they've just revived. And he zooms, it's a very close up picture. And it also allows uh, Peter Cushing to show off some of his acting because Cushing is playing a bunch of subtext in there. Not only is there this big close up on him, very, very intimate close up, but he's also listening and you can see it going through his head. He's listening for the heartbeat 
and then he hears it and there's this reaction oh my god i've actually done it and and so it was a great moment for for uh peter cushing and it was a great bit of direction and you see that throughout now there's one shot in this one that you may recognize as having been parodied pr repeatedly over and over but originated with this film and that's where victor frankenstein is holding up a, uh, a magnifying glass and they've got it shot in such a way as his eye appears gigantic through the magnifying glass before he puts down it's it's damn near a trope now and it's been parodied and uh, you know over and over but that's where they got this I would uh, also ask you well I'll, I'll wait to talk about that when I get to production design um, but they do a lot of that they do a lot of that with direction where because they were forced to be intimate with the camera work because they didn't have these huge sets and there aren't that many sets I think there's four <laughs> there's an exterior location and it's like four sets because they didn't have it to work with they got creative about what they did and what they did was oftentimes close-ups or you know two shots or that sort of thing but it was all pretty it was all competently done and occasionally quite um, you know creative uh, as goofy as it looks now that one with the magnifying glass very creative at the time very creative so great direction not surprised that he would win the Hugo the year later for Dracula cinematography on this is by Jack Escher um, his IMDb is 1935 to 65 with 43 cinematographer credits 14 camera and electrical department credits which usually means he was the guy running the camera he worked exclusively in film, and as you might be able to suggest from looking at this, he did quite a lot of Hammer's horror films. He was nominated for the BAFTA in 1964 for the Scarlet Blade, and his cinematography is going hand in hand with the director. And here we get into that technicolor that Larry was mentioning being very, very vivid at that time. And the fact that a cinematographer had to know how to work with those kind of colors. You know, you had to work with colors that were very vivid. You had to know how to shoot that. You needed to know how to light it. You had to know how to set those shots up. So not only was he getting everything the director needed, not only was he working you know, very limited budget, which meant very little time. Anytime you have a limited budget, you have limited time to set up these shots. And he knew how to do it in Technicolor, which is not as easy as it sounds, especially back then. It's easy to make that look like crap, um, but he did it. He pulled it off very well. He was able to get those shots, and I think probably did a fair amount. In this case, I think you can say he did a fair amount of collaboration with the director on what the director wanted and what he was able to produce. And again, very limited budget, just over three-quarters of a million in modern dollars. You, know, you look at this film. I did not know it was that low. I knew it was a low budget, but I did not know it was that low until I did the research and I went, holy crap, you know, roughly three quarters of a million and they did this kind of work on it, that's amazing. You know, you had some really talented people both in front of and behind the cameras and the cinematography here it shows. It's, it's just really well done, you know, considering how much little time and money they must have had and yet the cinematographer was able to get these, you know, really good, really colorful shots that really added to the, you know, the whole look and feel of the film. So, uh, production design on this film. And usually a production designer or an art director uh, is um, going to be somebody who is responsible for sets or settings. In this case, we have both a production designer and an art director. I'm not sure where the crossover is there. Quite possibly, the art director was the guy who made sure the sets looked like they were supposed to for the sort of things they were. And the production designer designed the sets. Production designer was Bernard Robinson, who has an IMDb from 1940 to 1969 with 42 production designer credits, 36 art director credits, almost exclusively horror films, and a large number of them for Hammer films. He hasn't won any awards, but production design here, again, low-budget film, <laughs> just barely over three-quarters of a million dollars you know, in modern money. And he was able to come up with sets that, despite the fact that in an er a baron, an aristocrat's castle like this, you would expect things to be 
much bigger. If you want to see what I'm talking about, go watch the 2004 film because they had a ton of budget on that and they do show Victor Frankenstein's castle as being the approximate appropriate size. You know, they would have huge ballrooms and huge um, you know, dining rooms and things like that. Well, you couldn't do that here. It had to be all much, much, much smaller than that. And the production designer and art director do a great job of this. Again, low budget, but unless you know going in that it's that low a budget, I don't think the average person would look at it and see anything particularly amiss. The sets are well designed so that they can, you know, get in and do this kind of, you know, intimate close-up photography that they needed to do. And they are effective. It looks like a rich person's home, um, if not as large as it probably ought to be. It still looks like a rich person's home. Um, no problems with it whatsoever. And there were some places, and again, I'm unclear how much of this to attribute to the art director versus the uh, production designer. Um, and I'll just mention the art director was a guy by the name of Edward Marshall. Um, and uh, I don't think I've got a picture of him. Edward Marshall um, and his IMDb was 1945 to 1978 with 34 art director credits, 13 art department credits, and a three production designer credits, almost exclusively film. And he had five nominations, two Oscars, and three BAFTAs. Again, hard to do for me to know how this broke down in terms of who did what, production designer versus art director. But I can say that there were some things that were pretty um, innovative. Now, if you... Um, you know, if you look at the uh, Universal films, it's pretty consistent that Frankenstein brings his monster to life with electricity that comes down in a storm. Not here. They were being more consistent with the book. In the book, it's done very differently in terms of how he gets the electricity, um, but it was done from a 1918 perspective. This was from a 1957 perspective, but they're still generating their own power. They're not waiting around for a, a lightning bolt to strike. They are generating their own power. One thing I would definitely have you notice, <laughs> I would call your attention to in probably the production design, is the tank that the creature is kept in before it is brought to life and as it's brought to life. Keep that tank in mind when we go to when I go to review the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Rocky Horror takes a lot of different things from a lot of different science fiction. Keep that tank in mind when I go to review that. Um, that's sort of iconic now. And again, these sets, man, low, low budget, but very talented people working behind the scenes who could still make it work. So, you know, hats off to all these guys. They were really good at their jobs. Visual effects, and in this case we're talking about a matte painter here because that's all really the only visual effects they had. Everything else was practical. Was Les Bowie, and his IMDb is 1956 to 1977 with 68 special effects credits, 11 visual effects credits, and in a genre we would recognize his work from Star Wars, the first one in 1977, Superman, and 2001, A Space Odyssey. And he won an Oscar in 1979, rather, a Special Achievement Award for Superman. Also won a BAFTA, also in 1979, for Superman. Uh, you know, the, the, the biggest um, matte painting that I can recall in the thing was the very first one that we see. Um, it's when the uh, priest is going up through this winding, you know, road up to where the building, the castle, that the uh, jail is located. And behind that is a matte painting. If you didn't know... You wouldn't know it was a matte painting. I think it still holds up well even today. I suppose if I were watching this thing on Blu-ray, you know, probably be able to see matte lines and things like that. But hey, it still works. It is still a great matte painting. And uh, he went on to get an Oscar, man. So you know, what do you expect? Uh, that's really his main contr contribution to the, uh, the visual effects. It's the matte paintings that he did. Um, then there's the makeup, which was done by Philip Leakey. Um, now, his IMDb, 1949-1975, with 58 makeup department credits, um, uh, almost exclusively film, and a lot of horror movies, and no awards. And when you look at this guy, again, he was working under a constraint, 
They could not let this makeup look anything like the Boris Karloff makeup from Universal. Could not look like that at all. That said, I think I like this better. Um, while Karl Karloff's was absolutely iconic and very effective the first couple of times you saw it, after that, it started to almost be blasé to the point where, uh, what, 1950s or 1960s, you had the TV series The Munsters with exactly the same makeup, you know, more or less. And uh, got to be kind of blasé. This one is, I don't think, ever blasé. And that's because it's really the only film in which this kind of makeup is used. And it's effective to me because it's just saying, okay, this is a guy who has literally stitched this monster together from parts. Every single part of him, his entire face was stitched together from somebody else's pieces parts. Um, so I like the makeup quite a lot. Uh, and again, working on a tiny budget, and yet he was still able to come up with makeup that A, looked real, you know, in terms of this is what a guy who would be stitched together out of parts would look like, and at the same time could do it in a very small budget. You know, gotta hand it to all these guys. Such a tiny budget, man. Barely over three quarters of a you know of a million, and they still were able to come up with good stuff. Now, to my eye, his makeup ages well. Um, I don't know for sure what it would look like if I was watching it in Blu-ray or something like that. But to my eye, as somebody who grew up with this kind of makeup, it looks like it ages pretty well. Um, which, again, considering the budget, is pretty fracking amazing to me. So. You know, great, great makeup as far as I'm concerned. Uh, costume design here was by Molly Arth. I'm sorry, Ar Arbuthnot. Arbuthnot. Molly Arbuthnot. Who signed to be as 1948 to 67 with 62 costume and wardrobe ad, ad, ad department credits, three costume designer credits, and did a lot of Hammer films. We're going to see a recurring theme on this because the Hammer films tended to be fairly low budget. And so we're talking about people who were good at their jobs, doing a low budget film and making it work well. What a surprise that Hammer would keep hiring them. <laughs> if they can make this kind of movie for under a mill, well, hire them back to make another one under a mill. Um, in terms of her costumes here, they're largely period costumes, more or less. The thing about costumes, you know, unless you're being extremely careful about it, and, and uh, this is another one of those places where, you know, like 2004 Frankenstein movie, they had a crap ton of money just more money than they know what to do with almost and so they could be ultra realistic with the costumes here there are liberties taken and that happens a lot um i'm always struck by it in the film back to the future part three um, clara is wearing a dress that is so low cut for that time period it would have been utterly scandalous particularly on a school teacher who was supposed to be above moral reproach they make some similar things here you know, the uh, at the time period, yes, they were wearing corsets, and they do wear corsets. Oh, man. Ladies, you think it got it terrible now. You think it was bad in the 1950s. Just go back another half century or more, and you're dealing with freaking corsets. You know, cinch yourself up. As uh, bad you think your uh, self-image is today, man, try cinching all of your weight into a corset. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's mentioned in one of the Little House in the Prairie books that Laura's mother's waist when in a corset her father's hands could fit around it like this so they were wearing corsets they weren't wearing horrifying corsets and they were taking some liberties with other things going on with cleavage and stuff like that this was the era of the bullet bra and you can kind of see it but that always happens that tends to happen a lot you know unless they're going to be ultra realistic they will usually incorporate something of modern fashion into the time period. But it was otherwise fine. And it was always very bright. You had this, again, Technicolor. Everything was bright. Um, and it works fine. My uh, only minor, minor, minor criticism of costumes has to do with sound. And that may have been the sound guy's fault more than anything else. There are occasions like when Frankenstein is busy uh, kissing and making out with his, uh, his maid 
that you can really hear the ruffling of those costumes from whatever they were made of. You can hear them scratching a bit. Uh, it wasn't anything that, you know, probably was very, um, anything that would jump out of the average viewer. It's just to me, my ear, I heard it. And I went, oh, okay. Somebody should have done a better job either with the uh, fabric of the costuming or the sound guy or something. But again, man, uh, under a mill, <laughs> it's just amazing that they made what they did. Always have to keep in mind that this is an incredibly low-budget film. And as a low-budget film, it works so well that that tells you endless volumes about the kind of people they had working both behind and in front of the camera all the way around. So, Lastly, we have John Hollingsworth, who did the music for this, who has another one of those big IMDb's, 1941 to 1964, with 137 music department credits. Means he did a lot of music. Um, no awards on him, but again, low budget. Um, the music is not anything that I would sit down and go, oh yeah, that sounds amazing. I wanna go listen to that as standalone musical pieces. This is not John Williams. This is not you know James Horner. This is not Michael Giacchino, Giacchino, who I, as Marshall once suggested, I now place him up in the maestro level as a modern composer who hits that. Uh, it's not that, but <laughs> it's still effective. It still uh, does what it needs to. It fits the action. It is uh, consistent with sort of horror movies of that time. Uh, it isn't over the top. Um, it isn't, uh, you know, it's, it's not shockingly understated does what it needs to no problems with it could have been somebody much much worse doing this with this crappy little budget again tiny budget and taking that into account you go wow to make a film this effective and this popular and this well made means that there were a lot of good people running behind this this could have been plan nine from outer space with this kind of budget this could have been plan nine from outer space but it wasn't, and that's because they had a lot of good people working on this film. So at the end of all this, do we ask ourselves, is this any good? Yes, yes. This is a, I, I like this film quite a lot. This was uh, the first time that I've ever seen the film all the way through its entirety. I had seen pieces before the reveal of the monster and things like that. I had never seen it all the way through, and I liked it quite a lot. It is the first time that this stuff was in color. These monsters had only ever been seen in black and white, and because it uses this very vivid uh, technicolor to do it, it's very effective. Uh, Hammer would go on to do that, do very effective, vivid color films with these characters, and it works very well. The performances are great, um, particularly Peter Cushing. Again, when a guy can be almost, you can almost sympathize with him through a chunk of the movie, well, he's a good actor. You know, you're playing a heavy who thinks of himself as a good guy, but you can still identify with him. That's good acting. Uh, I would uh, definitely recommend watching this just about any time, uh, particularly if you're a fan of horror movies in general. This is one of those ones that shows you what is possible, what you can do in terms of a good horror movie or a good movie in general on a very limited budget, just provided you have the right people. You know, starting from the scriptwriter to the actors to everybody operating behind the scenes. When you got the right people, you can make a very good movie for a very small budget, and it certainly was. And that, oddly enough, I got done early for once on a review. <laughs> Next week is the sequel to this, The Revenge of Frankenstein, which starts off, I've watched it twice already, starts off right where this one ends. <laughs> Victor Frankenstein is being led off to the gallows in the end of this film, and the next film is going to start right there and goes in a surprisingly different direction, a very different direction from any of the horror films that were done by Universal. Completely different direction for a Frankenstein movie with a surprise twist at the end that is a completely different direction. So I'm looking forward to that one as well. So other things I'm going to talk about tonight. Oh, man. I mentioned at the top of the show, I am going to talk about the Judge Kavanaugh situation. 
Now this is going to come out as a clip, so I'm going to give myself several seconds of silence because I've learned if I'm going to take something out as a clip, I need to leave a little bit of silence for me to fade in and out. So I'll do two or three seconds of silence. So I'm going to talk about Judge Kavanaugh. Is it any good? Yes. Yes, this is a good movie. This is a very good movie. Absolutely, Larry, Larry. Very good movie. And I would uh, definitely recommend it. Oh, is the next one good? Yes. Yes, it is. Yeah, the next one is a really good sequel. Absolutely, really good sequel. Goes in a very different direction than this or any other uh, Frankenstein sequel and is very good as a consequence, particularly the particularly the end and it's why the movie that comes after this which i started watching but couldn't get through and will not review at all because it sucks so bad the one that comes next is so dramatically different than others that yeah you know it's it's really good and then the um the one that comes the third one that they made in this series goes off the rails completely and i never even want to review it i i got partway through and went oh that looks terrible and you know compared to the last two terrible and i don't want to review it so so a couple of seconds of silence again judge kavanaugh situation i've been watching this grow and i have to tell you now as as of last week it's last weekend i am now convinced that this is all complete nonsense complete nonsense from beginning to end this is a transparent attempt by democrats to derail a conservative supreme court nomination they've done this before in 1990 if you're old enough to remember they did this to a guy named judge bork and bork felt like it was such a damned thing to have to go through that he dropped out like they're hoping to get uh, Kavanaugh to drop out and then we got Clarence Thomas and they did it to him too the exact same thing came up with what must have been trumped up or overblown charges about you know sexual harassment they did it in 1990 they're doing it now no doubt they'll do it again they are hoping to push these democrats are to push this past the midterm elections because they think that they're going to pick up the house and quite possibly the senate i have to tell you guys i think you're morons i think as with hillary you are starting to believe your own press and your own uh, polls but there is a good chance that this thing in particular is going to backfire on you and you're going to lose big time now, I am not a Republican. I'm a libertarian. I don't have a skin in that game. But I have to tell you, considering how underhanded the Democrats have been with this crap, I hope they lose big time. You know, I don't like them any more than I like Republicans particularly, but when you're this low scumbaggy, I think you should face consequences by losing more seats. And I hope that's what happens. Super Chris says, uh, I know this is off topic, but two misses uh, the guy in the rubber suit and uh, Godzilla, movies, Godzilla movies. I might do some of those. I might do some of those. I, I know Godzilla's too far. The original Godzilla, the only one I'd really be inclined to do is the original Godzilla, which is now so far off of its... Um, I'd have to see. It might be hitting a you know, 50, 50, 65th or something coming up soon. I'm not sure. Uh, do I miss him? Uh, you know, a little, a little... Uh, there was a charm about those earlier movies that, you know, that later ones don't have when they use uh, CGI and stuff. But I don't know. <laughs> anyway, I'm not a Republican. I don't have a skin in this. But be watching the Democrats being as unhanded as they are and as they have been before. I think they should face consequences by losing seats. And I hope they do. And by the way, a Gallup poll released today says that 80% of Republicans and leaners, that is people who matter in terms of swinging the vote one way or the other, approve of the Republican Party. 80% by Gallup, which is a pretty good polling outfit. I think Democrats should be worried, and I think that's a good thing. As I say, I'm not a Republican, but these guys have been so underhanded that I think they should face consequences for it. Uh, Super Cruz says, I always thought libertarians were Republican that smoked weed. Uh, not really. Not really. Not really. Um, my general feeling about, about Republicans and Democrats is um, this is how you can tell the difference. 
Democrats believe that everybody is, and this is at the federal level. This is not necessarily when you get down to individual and local level. When you get to the federal level, here's how you can tell the difference. Democrats believe that everyone is a little bit stupid, and so they need government to, do, to make decisions that they are too stupid to make. Republicans, on the other hand, think that everybody is a little bit evil, and so need government to make decisions that they are too evil to make. And so that's why you get the government that we do now. They're all out there thinking they need to make decisions that we're too stupid or too evil to make for ourselves. Um, I know, I know, it's just kind of a joke. And that's often how we're described. Uh, we, we're, we're the guys who like guns and weed, put it that way. We're into guns and weed. Uh, not at the same time, but, you know, guns and weed. In terms of some specifics of these accusers, because as of yesterday or the day before, there are now two of them. There is Christine Blasey Ford. Um, I, uh, oddly enough, the weird thing is, and it's interesting to note this, I can't find a better picture of her than this. Kind of weird. Usually you'd have your attorney, uh, you know, floating around something better than this, but this is about the best picture you can get. Okay. One has to ask oneself, did this incident occur at all? Well, there's no real way to tell. But until Deborah Ramirez came forward uh, this weekend, I was at least leaning towards the possibility that maybe it happened to her, but she was misremembering or was getting things wrong. Now I totally disbelieve her. Sorry, thank Deborah for that one, but I now totally disbelieve Ford. I do not think it ever happened. I think it is a giant setup and she was never assaulted because these are power mad sociopathic narcissists we're talking about. That's what people at the federal level are. And they see a conservative judge as threatening their power for decades to come, which it kind of would for the Democrats. So they will do anything to stop it. And I think that now that this is a complete lie. I do not believe her for a picosecond. Not anymore. Blame the second woman to come around. Now, even if I believed her, which, you know, if you think, all right, well, maybe it happened. Think about how this went. She went to, the only time this ever came up was during a therapy session in 2012. And I've seen the notes. The notes on them are nonspecific. And the thera therapist says that she made errors in the notes. Beyond that, all of the named witnesses that she said were there have denied any knowledge of either the party or Kavanaugh ever doing something like that. Or in one case, a woman who is a lifetime friend of Ms. Ford, Dr. Ford rather, says that she doesn't even know Kavanaugh and doesn't remember the party in question. You know, even if it happened, the problem with memories like that is they get fuzzy because trust me, I have a lot of fuzzy memories. <laughs> It only gets worse over time. If you ask me anything about high school, you know, 30 years ago, I might be able to recollect fairly clearly a few anecdotes, but it would be very damn few. Um, and I'd have to qualify it. I'd have to say, you know, any time I had tried to recollect something like that, I'd have to say, well, that's how I remember it, but it has been a long time, and I could be wrong on details. You know, I just wouldn't know for sure. And in fact, there's a case in point of this when I did uh, the review of the blob and I was talking about uh, full service gas stations. And my recollection had been that they were still around when I started driving at age 16. I know they were around when I was a child, but I'm not quite sure when they really went away. My memory is that there were still some around when I was first started driving. But I'm not sure. When I was questioned on it on the show, I had to think about it for a while. And now I'm not really sure. I think they were, but it's been a long, long time. And I could be wrong. Now, admittedly, that's not the same thing as a sexual assault. But I'm here to tell you, man, your memories get fuzzy as you get older. There's no way around it. Stuff just slips out. And things that you think you remember with perfect detail, you are wrong on. I have a friend who has some level of autism. There's a guy whose opinions that I would trust about that era. 
because anytime I see him, he talks about these things as if it happened yesterday. And he can remember more details about things that happened 30 years ago than I will ever imagine. But that's because he's got this disorder. Me? Forget it. When he starts coming up with all these details about things that went on, I go, oh, yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah, okay. Oh, yeah, I remember that person. Yeah. You know, he'll come up with somebody's name that I haven't heard about in 30 years, maybe longer. I've known this guy since grade school. He'll come up with somebody's name, and I'll be like, who was that? That was that. And he'll say, and I'm like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I remember that. But he'll, like a shot, um, my memories are much more fuzzy. The average person's memories are much more fuzzy. You just can't be sure. In any case, I don't believe her anymore. Not anymore. Some stations had uh, self-serve and full-serve at the same time. Yeah, they did. Um, the question just came up was, were those just gone by the time? Because that would have been about 1980, let's see, I was 16. 81, I guess, 82. I just don't remember. I just don't remember. The, the, the memory is too fuzzy at that point. Uh, uh, Super Cruise 63 says there were still first uh, full service gas stations when we were first uh, driving, but self serve was the new norm, and we are in that same age, which is why it's so fuzzy. I just don't remember for sure. There was a tip over point, and I don't recall where exactly that happened. Um, and if you asked me to pin it down, I wouldn't be able to. Anytime you get memories that old, you're talking about them being fuzzy. And the fact that she only brought this up once in 2012 and was not specific enough. At the time, apparently, when she brought it up, she didn't even say who did it. I think this is totally political, and I do not believe Dr. Ford at all. Not anymore. I do not believe her. This was made worse this weekend with Deborah Ramirez coming out. This one I consider utter nonsense. She only remembered it after the Democrats started looking for more victims. And until last week, she wasn't even as sure who it was or if it happened. And that's because she was blind drunk at the time. I totally disbelieve her. I do not believe her claim for a picosecond. This is all just attempting to railroad someone who really shouldn't be railroaded. Is he going to be a great Supreme Court justice? I don't know. But what they're doing right now is just utterly transparent, and I hope that they lose big time in the next elections because I think when you do this sort of crap, this obvious political crap, that you should pay, suffer some consequences for it. Now, there is a moral to this story, sadly. There is a moral to this story for all the rest of us. The moral of the story is several fold to begin with. We must now ask ourselves, after decades of having been told you should always believe the victim, should we always believe the victim? And the answer is no, because there are now too many instances of outright lying about this sort of thing. There are just too many. It goes from domestic violence lies to rape lies to murder lies. It is quite clear from the statistics and anecdotal evidence that women do this sort of thing all the time just to get back at someone because they're mad at them, particularly men, and they face no serious consequences as a result. And besides, remember, everybody, I always like to say, in 1978, I was sexually assaulted by Kathleen Kennedy at the sleazy Duds Laundromat in Tucson, Arizona. Do you believe that? That's just what I say in joking, because I want to get Kathleen Kennedy out of Star Wars. I am not, however, trying to get her off the Supreme Court. For those, you get real lies. And that is why we do not any longer automatically believe the victim. There are too many instances where women have lied. Uh, Larry Larry says, how do you troll for people to accuse people to do this? Um, uh, in this case, I th in, in terms of Dr. Ford's case, I think it was a question of her, maybe something happened somewhere but it wasn't Kavanaugh, and 
I think she had a feeling that that was the case, which is why she didn't want her name brought into this to begin with. And it's why we're ha they're having a hard time getting her to come into the Senate because there's some possibility she may be found out to being, uh, to, uh, you know, lying under oath. I'm dead certain that Ramirez, if she pops in, is going to lie under oath. But in terms of how you troll people, well, they do it exactly the same way they did last week. Actually had somebody come out and say, hey, if there's any other victims, come on out. And what a shock they found somebody who decided that despite the fact she was blind, stinking drunk and didn't know for sure if it ever happened or who did it, well, we got a second accuser. This is just... This is just them trying to put this off, trying to get it into the past the midterm elections. Now, in terms of other aspects of this, in terms of no, we should no longer believe the automatically believe the victim, which, by the way, I would have done. At one point, I would have automatically believed the victim, but it is clear now that we cannot. We cannot automatically believe the victim. That is an inappropriate assumption to make. Now, ladies, if you are sexually assaulted, I insist that you put on your big girl panties and you report it when it happens. If you wait more than much longer than 24 hours to report it, it's very possible that I will not believe you and that I will not believe you if I find myself on your jury. I may not believe you. If you want me to believe you, you have to report it when it happens. There is no longer any excuse for not doing so because the default position for me is to disbelieve you. If you wait 30 years, I think you're lying. Larry Larry says, I think Dems are afraid of losing Roe v. Wade, so we'll try anything to keep their abortion industry going and keep their power. I don't think Roe v. Wade is under... Is, going to have any level of this. I think what they're worried about is that they're going to get a conservative Supreme Court, which they kind of would. And they can't have that. They just can't have it. A Supreme Court that actually was a constructionist Supreme Court, that is one that believed in the Constitution as written, would strike down 99.9999999% of the laws in the United States is being flatly unconstitutional by any sane reading of the document. This is, at least in principle, a threat to their power. And they are all power-mad sociopathic narcissists and will never give up that power without a big damned fight. This represents a massive possible problem for their own personal power. Supergroup 63 says if she is lying, she should be punishment for defamation. Just my opinion, it hurts more than just one person. I agree. But women do this all the time. All the time. Make no mistake, this is common practice. Lying about domestic violence, lying about rape, lying about assault, it's common. Women should not be automatically believed. They should be believed if you go to court and if they have taken the time to actually tell the police and get into a hospital where it can be taken forensic evidence and we can prove it in court. Otherwise, no, I'm not going to believe them. Not anymore. You've got to go on, put on your big girl panties and go into the cops. Otherwise, no, I don't believe you. Not anymore. I've seen too much. Uh, Super Cruise says Roe v. Wade is already law. Hard to, yes, law can be changed or thrown out. Name when the last time that happened. They were going to get rid of Obamacare. That ain't going to happen. Not now, not ever. The last time that they, um, did they, let's see, when was the last time that they actually repealed a law at the federal level? What's that? Oh, I hear crickets chirping. Never happens. So, ladies, get this straight and get it good. These and many other women have fracked it for you. Where I would once have sided with a woman automatically, it would be foolish to do so now. you got to report it when it happens or I will not believe you, not even on your jury. That's the way the world is now. Deal. For the men... There is also a moral to this story. It is now outright dangerous to associate with women because you have no idea who may accuse you of something that will destroy your life. 30 years or more later, 
quite possibly for the rest of your life. If you must, for some reason, associate with women, audio and or video record every single contact that you have, illegally or not, and never, ever, ever delete them because you may need them to prove that you are innocent of something that will destroy you 30 or more years down the road. Always make copies and recordings of every single interaction that you have with women. I hate coming to that conclusion. That's the world now. Just like the ladies deal. And yes, Larry, Larry, the very next thing on my list, I have a bullet point about it, MGTOW. MGTOW, men going their own way, MGTOW. I do not like finding myself in the MGTOW corner. I really, really don't. However, it has now become clear that the best option for men is to not associate with women until such time as they have cleaned up their acts. But there is at this time no reason to be associated with them. Legally, marriage is a completely losing proposition for a man. If he gets divorced and there's some very good likelihood of that, the men will be left destitute for the remainder of their entire lives. Destitute. You will be poor for the rest of your life. If you get married and divorced, you're done. Any kind of association with women at this point risks life-destroying accusations 30 or more years after the fact, and in fact for the rest of your life. The only rational thing to do at this point is to avoid women completely for their entire lives. Not men's lives the women's lives. We must let, as I've said before, when I'm the only other occasion I've mentioned MGTOW, the appropriate thing to do is to let an entire generation of women die alone and childless. Is it harsh? Yes. Is it fair? Nope. But it's the only way that the next generation will clean up their acts. Because something men don't really understand, because we can take it or leave it, Women really do live in some fear that they will live alone for the rest of their lives. We must allow what female children there are of the next generation to watch those women living alone for the rest of their lives because we will not touch them anymore. I'm sorry, guys. I'm sorry, ladies. But this is what it's come to. This is the world now. Deal. Supergrew says, I uh, knew a guy that got fired for saying you look nice, not sexy or ooh la la, just nice. Yes, there is no reason to be associated with women whatsoever. And if you are going to be, make sure you record it all without her knowledge. Doesn't matter whether it's legal or not. You may need it to prove that something did or did not happen. Supergrew says, this is why I will stay single for the rest of my life. Been there, done that. Me too. But regardless of that, just look at this one case. Then go look at the statistics. They want to say that women, that men are the domestic uh, abusers. Well, actually, no. The statistics are on the other side. They just don't like to say it. No, the statistics are clear now. The anecdotal evidence, evidence can be found all over YouTube. Men who have taken videos of women. There's a guy, I've forgotten who it, he's got, but... Uh, Oh, there's one guy goes on to knock on a woman's uh, window because she's leaving her house with the stereo kicked up to an extraordinarily high level. He knocks on her window and says, hey, why'd you leave the stereo up? And she starts screaming, oh, he's, a, he's, he's assaulting me. This guy's assaulting me. I'm going to call the cops. He's assaulting me. Well, if he didn't have that sucker on video, the cops would have thought he was assaulting her. Another guy who was having uh, some kind of argument with his girlfriend in the car and she opened the door while the car was driving and tossed herself out in order to claim that the man had been abusing her. Then, of course, there's high-profile cases like the Duke lacrosse one. Complete lies all the way through. 
No, it's quite clear that you can't trust them. Not at this point, not anymore. We must let an entire generation die alone and childless. And the ones that come after will have watched that and they will clean up their acts. Right now, it is stupid, stupidity writ large for any man to be involved with any woman whatsoever. Just look to this. If nowhere else, just look to Kavanaugh. Record everything. Don't ever delete it for the entire rest of your life. Make sure that you have those recordings. Uh, Super Crew 60 says, I thought everything was about equal rights, but it doesn't really seem that way. No, it has nothing to do with equal rights. Not anymore. Feminism has zero to do with equal rights. Not anymore. No. Uh, feminism is uh, nothing less than me misandry. That's the opposite of misogyny, by the way. Hatred of women. Misandry is hatred of men. This is why men are headed towards sex bots. Because they would rather be with a robot than have to deal with this. At least you don't have to worry about a robot saying that you raped it. So, okay, that's basically all I got to say about that. Um, I dislike being in the MGTOW position, but I am, because it is now quite clear that that is the only rational position to be in at this point in time. I hate it. But that's the only rational position to be in. On a little brighter note, fortunately there is brighter notes after this one, thank God. Um, oh, I don't have a uh, thing without that. Hang on a second, let me find another uh, show one. All right, I'm going to talk a bit about something that I've been watching for the last week or so and have been very, very enthused by. And that is Ivan or Ivan Ortega's rather fanned edit of The Last Jedi. This is extremely cool. Um, you know how I preface my show, I talk about it, I say I can talk about this with some authority, and not as much as a current working actor, but with some authority. Well, there is a guy out there, Ivan Ortega, who has been working on a fan edit of The Last Jedi who can talk with a hell of a lot of authority. This fan up edit is shaping up to be on par, if not maybe better than, the Star Wars uh, despecialized editions. Those were an edition that an editor and colorist took and made into the exact, pristine, recolorized versions as we saw them in the theaters in 1977 and so forth, pre any of Lucas screwing with them and recorrecting the color on it because the color correction has been off ever since Lucas changed the things corrects the color and it's an amazing thing I love it because it's, it's showing me what I saw in the movie theaters so I love that it's awesome but this one this re-edit of The Last Jedi is turning into the fan edit of all edits so for months the, the fa fascinating thing to watch is and I only discovered this recently Ivan Ortega has been um, re-editing this but he'll explain it inside videos so he'll show you in his editor what is being edited and why he's editing it and he will explain I mean you should watch these because you'll actually learn more about the sorts of things that I talk about because you know when I talk about cinematography and stuff like that I'm talking with it from a certain eye but this is a guy who's going through and making very specific changes how to tighten things up how to pull things out how to throw things away how to bring things in from you know outtakes and stuff like that the alternate stuff that didn't make it into the movie in order to make it a more coherent film and one frankly that is shaping up to fix everything particularly the way that Luke was handled Luke does not die at the end in his edit Everything that I've been critical of, everything I've heard other people who are critical of this movie be critical of, is being fixed up to and including Admiral Akbar does not die. <laughs> I hope, I hope very much that this is a film that I can enjoy and I will be reviewing it when it's done. Is he still working on it? Yes, he is. He's not finished yet. Um, there's no deadline on this. It's a fan edit. It'll be done when it's done. But I am following him very closely. I will update here as he goes along. No doubt there will be a torrent somewhere. 
and I'll, I'll do a review of this. It looks good enough. There's a teaser trailer. I have a link to it in the description below. There is a teaser trailer, and I definitely suggest you go watch it, and then go over to his channel and watch all of the videos where he walks through this, because it's really quite astonishing. He is virtually rebuilding this film from scratch. You know, right from the beginning. Luke gets handed his lightsaber. He doesn't throw it over his shoulder. He holds it and hands it back to her and says, it calls to you now. Right there. And then the whole training thing is a lot more like Yoda, but with Luke thrown in. It's not Luke saying, no, I'm not going to train you. It's him saying, yes, you need to be trained, and I'm going to do it. And he rearranges everything to make it work. Rearranges it all. Gets rid of all of the stuff that I really hated about this film, and hopefully when it's over, it'll be turned into something. He even auditioned voice actors so that they could have people go back and add lines for Admiral Akbar, add lines for Luke Skywalker, because there's a number of... The whole thing with Ben Solo does not go down at all the way that it does in the film. It makes him, uh, you know, Luke much, much more consistent with the way he was in the prequels. It is not somebody who's given up. So it's, it's really good. Uh, Mark Hamill seems to be fed up with all the new movies. Oh, God, yes. Uh, you know, watching him when he was doing the press junkets, he would outright say, I said to Ryan Johnson that I hate everything that you're doing about my character. And that was it. He'd end right there. Most actors, when you're out doing a press junket right like that, right, they'll say, you know, when I first started, I really didn't like what had been done with the character. But then I gave it some thought, and I thought, you know, no, this works. It's different than what I thought, but I'm still going to do my best job and everything. No. You just say, I totally disagreed with everything he did with my character. Done. Told me volumes about what he thought. Uh, Larry, Larry says, I wonder how George Lucas, Lucas feels about the new movies. Really feels? Oh, well, he's said it. You know, when he wasn't, uh, didn't have to walk it back, he said it's like he turned over his babies to the white slavers, and he did. Um, you know, as bad as the prequels sucked, to me, the current trilogy makes them look good. So, <laughs> I, uh, as I say, I'll be updating when this stuff comes out. There is, however, a teaser trailer. Go over and watch the teaser trailer. Link below. And again, go to his channel. He has so many videos where he's walking through individual scenes that he's re-editing, and he's going to such detail. He is pulling things and moving things around and adding music and removing dialogue and adding dialogue that wasn't present. He's got somebody CGI-ing Admiral Akbar into this film. Blue-haired lady does have a role, but it's not as prominent. And her not telling Finn, her not telling uh, Poe about what the plan is makes sense now. I think this is going to be a fantastic edit that goes far beyond any other fan edit I've ever seen. So, uh, and just based on what I'm seeing in his videos, watch, go watch. You'll be enthralled. I, I have been enthralled every time he's had one of those. And this is not the only thing that he's going to re-edit. He's re-editing other, other things as well. And the one I'm really looking forward to is when he re-edits Batman v Superman. Because there's a film that needs a serious, serious edit. And yes, Larry, Larry, he is a professional editor. He absolutely is a professional editor. Yes, he does this for a living. Yeah. So, go watch. Subscribe to Ivan Ortega's um, channel. If you enjoy me, you are going to love him. And your brain is going to love you for the rest of your life. <laughs> Super Guru 63 says that's why, the, uh, that's why The Empire Strikes Back is still the highest rated Star Wars film. This, I don't know for sure how it's going to come out, but the whole relationship with Luke and Rey is totally changed in editing. Completely changed. Largely with the change of the editing and the addition of some voiceover stuff. It is no longer him being goofy and telling her he won't train her. It is a montage of him training her. And he does not die at the end. So, it's something I'm looking forward to. 
Um, the people who have, they've got reaction videos out there, people who've seen the, uh, the trailer, the teaser trailer. The reaction is about like I'd expect. And one of the things that I really liked about it was there was one girl who watched it and uh, she started to cry. You know, she was saying, this is something that maybe my dad and I can have some memories together with, which she couldn't with the previous film. Even the little kids are saying they like it. Um, so I think it's got every possibility of being a really good film. And uh, I will review it when it comes out. But in the meantime, go over, subscribe to him, watch the videos. Your brain is going to love you for the rest of your life. You are going to hear stuff like I say only on steroids. He will talk about the precise editing he's doing in order to make something flow better, in order to follow the the through line of the plot that whole thing with um uh um, um you know the the stupid animals gone just gone period gone um where um finn's trying to uh sacrifice himself at the end and is smashed out of the air by um uh, rose gone he still tries to sacrifice himself and isn't successful but for a completely different reason that makes sense in the context of this film it is a major, major, huge re-edit undertaking with involving additional CGI with Ad Admiral Akbar. He got somebody to do the additional CGI where he actually auditioned people to do voices so that they could find somebody who sounds like Luke Skywalker to do these additional narrations that he needed. Somebody that sounded like Admiral Akbar so they could do the additional dialogue that they needed. It's going to be a totally different movie. Uh, Larry Larry says, I'm surprised Yoda hasn't showed up in the new trilogy. He has. He did. He showed up in Last Jedi. He appears um, at the end and talks to Luke and then moves his pinky finger and causes lightning to come striking down, which is weird because if you think if he could do that, why didn't he do it in any of the other movies where he was a force ghost? You know, like Jedi? Who knows? Uh, anyhow. That is something I think you should go and look at. I will be keeping a very close track of that, and I will be talking about it as it comes up here. Right now, he is kind of in between things. He's waiting for stuff like CGI to get finished and all that. But if you go back and you watch his videos, it is spellbinding because he talks to you about what he's doing, why he's doing it, and exactly what order. He'll show you the, the scene as it originally was, then show you his new edit, and you just go, oh, yeah. It just makes it flow so much better. That's a lot of his stuff. He's just making it flow better so that you don't get distracted from various plots, you know, so it's really good. Your short term memory loss, loss. Well, it isn't exactly like it's all that memorable. It's just you're like, why did, what's him with, what's with him and lightning, you know, all of a sudden, as uh, Luke said in the How It Should Have Ended, which was better than the film it should have. So also watch How It Should, How Last Jedi Should Have Ended. That will actually make you feel uh, excited. <laughs> it did me. And all the re fan reactions. I don't do reaction videos, but if I'd done one, that would have been one to do a reaction video to because it just it did excite me in a way that uh, the actual film did. So I guess I could do a little bit of ad copy here before I get out for the night. <clears throat> all right, let me get my promo copy up. Uh, maybe your disappointment in the movies clouded your memory. Well, you are lucky. <laughs> but he's fixed it. He's fixed it. This is going to be an amazing fan edit. I think it's going to be really good. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> next time on Tales from S.Y.L. Ranch. In the year 1863, Baron Frankenstein escapes the guillotine and goes to Germany. Now he names himself Dr. Stein and plans to restart his terrifying experiments. Your blood will congeal when you see this brand new billion volt shocker. Be sure you can take this tremendous adventure into terror. That's next time on the Fandime Master's 60th anniversary review of The Revenge of Frankenstein. 
And of course, Sales from SYL Ranch is live here Mondays in North America at 9 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. Central, 7 p.m. Mountain, 6 p.m. Pacific, and if you're working off of UTC, 1 a.m. Tuesday morning. And a bit more about my upcoming reviews. I've talked about it last week and the week before, but after Revenge of Frankenstein, the weekend after that, I will be going out to the family ranch land armed solely with my phone, and I will be doing live streams impromptu more or less from there. I will not have a scheduled show on Monday. It will be impromptu live streams. Dr. Al Franken. <laughs> that would work. <laughs> Uh, October 8th, the weekend after that, is the first episode of the 13th Doctor, Jody Whitaker. I'm going to spend the whole two hours on that. It's worth doing. New Doctor. First time we have a female. New showrunner. New composer. Murray Gold's leaving. So it's definitely worth talking about on a lot of levels. I will do mini reviews for episodes after that. Um, something I can pull out and make into, um, you know, clips, maybe reel people in on the clips and keep them around for the regular two Almost two and a half hour show tonight. <laughs> October 15th, as I mentioned before, Regent, I will be doing a predestination because my regular viewer, Jay Haley, sent me a copy of this. It is a great film and definitely deserves a review. And if you send me a review, no matter film, no matter how crappy it is, I will review it. Uh, much like in Iowa, if they build it, they will. If you build it, he will come. If you send me the movie, I will review it. <laughs> On uh, October 29th, I will be reviewing the Rocky Horror Picture Show. As I say, keep in mind the production value on this one, where the monster was birthed inside of a big sort of uh, transparent uh, tank. And on Halloween, I'll be trying to do a uh, live stream with the audio from the 1938 broadcast of War of the Worlds, which is hitting its 80th anniversary on Halloween. And hopefully, I'll have things set up so that we will see trick-or-treaters coming in here behind me. Avoid the crap, folks, please. Yeah. Um, November 15th, I will be doing, uh, as I mentioned, the last week and the week before, the uh, 40th anniversary review of the Star Wars Holiday Special, but I'm going to do the abridged 45-minute watchable edition because I want you to see how editing can make this into a coherent, if not good, because it'll never be good, but coherent story. And the only thing they have definitely scheduled is on uh, December 17th, Superman the Movie, the 40th anniversary review of the best Superman movie ever made, and will probably be the best Superman movie that is ever made. I will fill in some more stuff in uh, November and December as uh, time goes on this next month. So I might ask you at this point... Say, pardon me, but could you help out a fellow American who's down on his luck? Hit the road! So if you like what I'm doing, please do like, sub, hit the notifica notification bell, tell all your friends, family, and neighbors to do the same. Check out my PayPal tip jar, my merch store, and my Amazon wish list. And as always, I will beg for a laptop that I have on there because it will make all of my technical problems disappear. If I got that thing before December, October 31st, that meant that would mean that I could just walk that sucker over to the door, turn it on, and be ready to go. As it is, I'm looking at having to drag a bunch of stuff up and to probably run about 50 feet of Ethernet cable to get it to work. <laughs> uh, but I'm going to try. I'm going to try. Um, if you did buy me that, you get to be the program director on this show and tell me whatever movies you want me to do in whatever order you want me to do them in. Review Duck Dodgers in the 24th and a half century. I could do that. It would be a fairly short review, but uh, the director on that one, Chuck Jones, is my favorite all-time Looney Tunes uh, director. So I'm, uh, that's a movie I like a lot. Yeah, yeah, it's not a bad idea. Yeah, the original cartoon, yes. Duck Dodgers in the 24th and a half century. Yes, I know the exact one you're talking about, where they get to Planet X. Yeah, I know the one. <laughs> I'd mention I do have some merch. I do have some merch. I have t-shirts, tank tops, hoodies, coffee mugs, stickers in a variety of sizes and colors. And they all have on the front my show logo with the show uh, the motto, always know where your towel is. And on the back, it currently has the YouTube channel name. But when I'm done and I think I'm ready to go to my website, that's going to change. It'll be my website on the back with the secondary motto of nothing that you see in the press is real nothing 
So I guess I would have to say that that is about all the time we have today, boys and girls. Tune in again next Monday for my uh, 60th anniversary review of the sequel to this film, Revenge uh, of Frankenstein. Until then, this is another highly acclaimed, world-renowned Tales from SYL Ranch, the vlogcast that reminds you to always know where your towel is. And I'm your host, Bill Stone. Ultimate power in this world has always been one simple thing, the control and manipulation of minds. In the year 1860, I, Baron Frankenstein, was sentenced to death on the guillotine. Why? Why had the world condemned me? Because I was the first man to create another living being. The first unnatural man. But because his brain was affected, because he could not control animal instincts, he was hunted down and brutally murdered. But I have escaped the guillotine and I shall avenge the death of my creation. Who is he? Nobody. He isn't born yet. You will witness scenes never before seen on a motion picture screen. You will see Frankenstein take the eyes of one man, the brain of another. You will see lifeless hands begin to move. You will see a man turn into the world's most terrifying monster. <laughs> <laughs>